Well, good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Planning Commission for our January 18th, 2023 meeting. Uh, Mr. Trainer, would you call the roll, please? Yes, Ms. Weiss. Here. Mr. Krasner. I'm here. Mr. Stevens. Here. Ms. Comont. Here. Mr. Hira. Here. Absent is Mr. Puentes and Ms. Teets. We have a quorum. Thank you. Uh, do commissioners have any questions on the agenda? If not, would someone like to recommend adoption move, of the agenda? I move we adopt the agenda for the Planning Commission meeting of Wednesday, January 18th, 2023. I second. Ms. Weiss on the second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? The ayes have it. We have an agenda. And with that, we uh, will move right into the listening session of the uh, East End Small Area Plan. We welcome everybody uh, who's attending this evening. Um, basically, what will happen is we will have a presentation from staff that will kind of set the stage. And then we will move into comments from people who are here uh, in the room. And then that will be followed up with uh, comments from anybody who's signed up uh, online. Uh, and with that, uh, Mr. Stoddard, are there any introductory comments that you wanted to make? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'm happy to introduce the item before I turn it over for the staff presentation uh, from Ms. Baysmore. Uh, but as you said, uh, the purpose of tonight's meeting is really to uh, provide uh, another opportunity. Uh-oh. How's this? Is this better? Yeah. All right. So uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, happy to introduce the item before I turn it over to Ms. Baysmore for the staff presentation. Uh, I think you got it right in your introduction that the purpose of tonight's meeting uh, is it's billed as a public listening session. And this is yet uh, another opportunity for public engagement and uh, public comment uh, on the draft small area plan. Uh, just a heads up on the materials, the draft plan in front of you tonight uh, remains uh, unchanged since you all last saw it in September. Uh, the purpose of that, of course, is that we've been taking the same materials out to all of these different stakeholder groups, uh, and we'll highlight these in the pre presentation as well. Uh, but numerous events run over the last several months, and the, the idea is to collect all of that feedback feedback, all that input, uh, and fold that into the plan to make it better, to make it stronger, uh, to make it more inclusive. Uh, and so you'll see that revised draft in response to all this comment with the benefit of all this comment uh, coming out to you in the next few months. Uh, but with that, I'll turn it over to Ms. Bazemore uh, for her presentation. And if I could just add real briefly before you start, uh, Ms. Bazemore, anybody who would like to speak this evening, uh, if you could fill out one of the little slips that's located uh, just outside the door there, that would just uh, require your name and address. That's, uh, that's all we need. Uh, and uh, that uh, will help with our record keeping. Thank you. Sorry to interrupt. No worries. Good evening, everyone. Good evening, members of the public, and good evening, Planning Commission. My name is Emily Bazemore, and I'm a senior planner with the City of Falls Church. I'd like to take a moment to walk you guys through our staff report before giving our uh, community engagement presentation that we've been using throughout the fall. Tonight, Planning Commission is requested to hold a public listening session to receive public input on the draft East End Small Area Plan. Following the listening session, the Planning Commission is requested to hold a work session to review comments received throughout the last several months of public engagement. Staff recommends that the Planning Commission hold the public listening session and use its work session to review the public comments received during several months of public engagement. Following tonight's listening session, based on public input and direction from the Planning Commission, staff will revise the draft plan. The revised draft will be shared with and reviewed by City Council and the Planning Commission during March and or February and March. Final consideration by both groups is tentatively scheduled for March of 2023. So I just want to provide you Planning Commission with some updates since your last work session in early August, August 3rd, 2022. The Planning Commission last reviewed the draft small area plan during its August 3rd, 2022 work session. Since then, staff has conducted extensive public outreach, including engaging with the city advisory boards and commissions, hosting a second community meeting, hosting a pop-up event at the farmer's market, conducting an online survey. We have started direct conversation with civic leaders and the Vietnamese American community, and we hope this can be ongoing. 
We have also consulted the Small Business Anti-Displacement Network, also known as SBN. What have we heard? Throughout this engagement process, community feedback has highlighted several priority desires for the area. They are as follows. Greater cultural focus to preserve Vietnamese culture. Participants have expressed a desire for a greater focus on celebrating and preserving Vietnamese culture, including and going beyond building preservation. Specific actions in support of this could include incorporation of a cultural overlay to the Eden Center area, recognizing the Eden Center archway as a historic monument, rebranding the area as Little Saigon or Little Vietnam, incorporating Vietnamese language onto street signs in the area, organizing a night market, and successful examples looking into these case studies throughout the country include New York's Chinatowns and San Francisco's Chinatown, as well as San Diego's Little Saigon and San Jose's Little Saigon. Another recommendation, small business versus nearby new development. Concern has been raised that new development in or near Eden Center would affect the rent prices for current tenants. Staff has been in touch with professionals from the Small Business Anti-Displacement Network. During these discussions, staff has explored solutions that could be incorporated into the revised plan to support small business owners. Many of these ideas are already included in the current draft of the economic development chapter. However, this section should be further reviewed and any needed follow-up activities should be identified. Number three, Eden Center community spans beyond the city boundary. Throughout the community engagement process, stakeholders living well beyond the city's boundaries have attended meetings and they have also written comments expressing appreciation for the Eden Center as well as concerns about potential displacement. The volume and geographic reach of participants speaks to the Eden Center being a beloved cultural center enjoyed by people throughout the Washington DC metropolitan area and beyond. Number four, green spaces are appreciated. Throughout the public engagement process, participants have expressed positive responses regarding the inclusion of green spaces into the East End, as well as the inclusion of the nearby Oakwood Cemetery into the plan. Participants also express interest in, in better incorporating the adjacent green space that is our city's Fort Taylor Park. Number five, pedestrian experience emphasis. Concerns regarding pedestrian experience in the East End have been raised throughout the engagement process. Unsafe conditions have been cited, including lack of crosswalks and overall lack of connectivity, particularly related to nearby transit options such as the East Falls Church Metro. The existing draft uh, transportation chapter provides significant, um, significant emphasis on better pedestrian experiences, bicycle and transit connections, including more crossings and a network of slower speed streets that emphasize accessibility. Now I'm gonna flip through a couple of different pages, Jack, throughout the staff report to get us to our community engagement section, which begins on line 326. So this section of the staff report notes different community engagement strategies that we've used throughout fall of 2022 um, and beyond because we began with community meeting number one. That was held in Stephenson Hall of Columbia Baptist, just like community uh, meeting number two, but back in November 6th of 2021, we get into exploring city council work sessions. City council is held two, um, one in March and one in September of 2022 as well as planning commission work sessions. You guys have seen the plan three different times now, the last time being on August 3rd. I also wanna highlight boards and commission reviews. The team has been to many boards and commissions. This begins on line 358. Uh, we've been to the Arts and Humanities Council, Housing Commission, Architectural Advisory Board, Citizens Advisory Committee on Transportation, the Urban Forestry Commission, the Historic, Architecture Advisory, or the Historic Architecture Review Board, the Human Services Advisory Council, the Historic Commission, the Economic Development Authority, and the Environmental Sustainability Council. The following boards also received draft plan materials and a recorded City Council work session for review and comments. These are the Recreation and Parks Advisory Board and the Library Board of Trustees. The Chamber of Commerce and the Village Preservation Improvement Society also reviewed the plan during fall of 2022. We held a farmer's market pop-up in October. If you go to the next page, you'll see some of the pictures of staff connecting with some citizens that were out there. Um, we also had yard signs throughout the POA. This was our way of advertising the ongoing planning effort and having a presence in the POA 
throughout this time. We also provided access to the latest materials by having QR code that people could hit and link to our, um, our webpage. We had community meeting number two back on November 19th of 2022. And we also published a community survey. This was published in Vietnamese, Spanish, and English. It ran from October to December of 2022. Now we're holding a public listening session. I'd like to highlight that this additional community engagement opportunity was identified as a result of community meeting number, 20, or number two. Um, we have circulated a digital flyer as well as passed out hard copies to businesses throughout the East End POA. The flyer was published in both English and Vietnamese. Another engagement tactic that we have used now is the FAQ. This was just published recently onto our webpage and it contains the following questions that are listed. Um, we met with a small group of community members to really identify some important issues that we could address through this FAQ. I encourage you all to take a look at the attachment um, in the staff report and it's also available online. I'm gonna skip the fiscal impact and I'm gonna go down to timing starting on 476. What I really wanna highlight in timing before moving on to the community engagement presentation is that this work session or this draft, the new draft, the revised draft, will return to council in early February. So staff will be incorporating some edits following this meeting. Now I wanna take a minute to go over our East End Small Area Plan um, community engagement presentation. This is our presentation that we shared at the community meeting. It's linked on our webpage, so it might look familiar to some of y'all. And also we have presented this to the various boards and commissions. Next slide, please. So why small area planning? To answer this question, we must understand what small area planning is first. These are long range plans applied to a small area, often 10 blocks or less, to address unique issues with tailored solutions. Small area plans help to shape the places that people live, work, shop, and play in the city of Falls Church. Next slide, please. We're gonna skip the agenda if that's okay. All right, where is the East End? As noted on the map on the left-hand side of the screen, the East End is at the southeast corner of the city. Um, it's noted in yellow, and it's POA 5, which is Planning Opportunity Area 5. Our planning opportunity areas are noted throughout that map, and our planning opportunity areas are established by our comprehensive plan. If you look at the vicinity map on the right-hand side of the screen, you'll see that the closest metro connection nearby is East Falls Church, and we have neighboring residential, and we have a neighboring cemetery, which is Oakwood Cemetery, as well as neighboring green space that is Fort Taylor Park. Next slide, please. We just went over this in the staff report, but it's just touching on some engagement in our process to date. I wanna highlight that all of our chapters completed drafting in August of 2022, and then shortly after returned to the city council for a work session in September. We began our public engagement process starting in October, which kicked off with boards and commissions review. Next slide, please. Now we're gonna get into our different chapters. We're gonna give a couple of highlights from each chapter and what you can find in the draft plan. So chapter one goes over intro and background. So here we're looking at history of the area. It spans all the way back to American Indian history. We also explore Civil War history, African American history, and post-World War II history, which includes Vietnamese American history in this area. All right, we also get into past studies. Here we're looking at the Fairfax Comprehensive Plan update done back in 2015. We're also looking at the Virginia Tech Student Study for the area and the ULI TAP from 2018, followed by ongoing projects which include the Fairfax County Ring Road as well as the BRT and Vision Route 7. Next slide, please. All right, on this slide we're moving into chapter two. This is our concepts chapter, um, and this is where we can find our vision statement. I'm just gonna read this off to everyone. The East End is a cultural hub focused on the Eden Center. Transportation investments put people first by prioritizing connectivity and accessibility. Green spaces provide opportunities for community members to gather, recreate, or relax. Nearby housing affordability is preserved while new commercial and residential development occurs within the planning opportunity area. A green approach to infrastructure, building, and site design support the environmental sustainability of the area for future generations. So again, this is what we envision the East End being. Next slide, please. Chapter two also gets into our goals. 
Um, so I'm just gonna read off our different goals for the East End. So we wanna start by number one, preserving the Eden Center and its cultural identity by celebrating Vietnamese American culture. Number two, we want to enhance multimodal mobility and accessibility throughout the East End. Number three, we want to strengthen the sense of community in the East End by providing active public spaces for the public to enjoy and gather while incorporating green space for connection to nature. Next slide, please. This brings us to our fourth goal. We want to preserve and provide quality affordable housing opportunities in the East End and around the East End. This includes maintaining the housing stock for a variety of incomes and exploring affordable housing options, possibly for seniors and expanding families. Our fifth goal, investing in the East End to create and maintain consistent economic activity and return the area to regional prominence. Number six, develop the area in an environmentally sustainable way. Moving on to the next slide. This gets us into our land use and zoning chapter. We're gonna fly through the first couple of slides, Jack. So we look at density and zoning. Our next slide, we'll get into our existing zoning map. And the slide after that, we'll get into existing land use. Um, so next slide, please. Here we're looking at our proposed land use. So what do we see the East End being 10 or 20 years in the future? We see the East End providing residential space for people to live. You can see that on the 24-hour fitness site where there's diagonal lines. That's noting um, new residential space. We see some mixed use opportunities, possibly on the Coons Ford site. Um, those are noted in red and blue. Um, that mixed use could include office space, which would be very interesting for the area. We see Eden Center being preserved, and this is noted by the preservation zone over Eden Center. We also see infill development neighboring the Eden Center as well as BJ's. What could this be? This could be smaller scale retail, so complementary retail spaces, um, as well as maybe some residential use. We see possibly senior housing being explored, but smaller scale over there. We also, again, we see mixed use um, potentially on the BJ site as well as some green space. Um, there's a huge parking lot out there right now. Perhaps we could turn it into some sort of pocket park or park space. Next slide, please. All right, this is getting into our nodes. Um, still on chapter three, land use and zoning. Node zero is green space and open space and it actually expands along the whole POA. Because what we want to do is we want to incorporate plazas and public areas. We want to incorporate spaces for children to play, walkable streets. And we want to look at rethinking the Oakwood Cemetery as an opportunity for green space. And I also want to throw in that we want to look at the Fort Taylor Park as well for an opportunity of green space. This is a city-owned park. Next slide, please. All right. This is node one. This is our 24-hour fitness and coon site. Um, here we see the potential for a town center style development where we could have active street facing retail and an opportunity again for residential or office use. Um, we also see this as a nice feature into the city of Gateway feature, welcoming feature that says you are in Falls Church on the East End. Next slide, please. All right, node two. So what do we envision for node two? This is Eden Center. We want to preserve the core existing structures. We want to look at a permanent ground level public space for people to enjoy festivals or movie nights or any sort of programming opportunities that could be there. We also want to look at infill development along the edges. So here is that opportunity for smaller scale senior housing, um, residential and retail mixed use. We also want to explore the idea of some structured parking. We've heard a lot during our public engagement that parking is an issue, and we want to explore that idea of structured parking and no two. Next slide, please. All right, our last node, this is east of Roosevelt Boulevard. Here we're looking at that info redevelopment again along Wilson Boulevard. We're looking at neighborhood serving retail, similar to something like uh, Westover in Arlington. So that scale is what we're really looking at for this end of town. Also looking at the potential for an indoor outdoor food hall or market, we think that would be a nice complementary use for um, other uses in the area already. Also looking at some green space at the front of BJ's. Next slide, please. Chapter four is our economic development chapter. There's a couple of key themes that are hit on in this chapter, and I just want to walk through those really quick. First, we have our existing commercial uses. I want to start off with Eden Center. It spans over 15 acres, and it houses over 125 retailers. 
Um, the 2019 U.S. Census estimated that there are over 700 jobs in the East End. Following existing commercial uses, we look at history of the Eden Center. In 1975, the fall of Saigon brought thousands of South Vietnamese um, to Clarendon. In the 1980s, metro construction displaced the Vietnamese people. Some relocated to the Seven Corners area, which redeveloped the Eden Center. Next slide, please. Here we're looking at recent property investments as well as land values and taxes. Next slide, please. And this is where we get into some strategies. I'm just gonna go over a few really quick. Here we're looking at enhancing placemaking efforts in the POA. We're looking at protecting and enhancing existing buildings. And we're looking at that infill um, along underutilized parking lots. And we're exploring things like the legacy business preservation programs, and we want to ultimately limit displacement of small businesses. Um, a lot of our strategies that are in this chapter and more that we plan to fold in into a revised draft are coming from the SBN network, their toolkit. Next slide, please. All right, this is our character and urban design chapter. So what can you find in chapter five? Um, we're looking at updating the area so that it is cohesive with our streetscape standards. So street trees and furniture and 20 foot setbacks. We're looking at walkable blocks and new connecting streets. Um, we're looking at narrowing Wilson Boulevard and adding cycling lanes and sidewalks um, and possibly removing one lane in each direction to do that. Next slide, please. All right, we're looking at site design and adding parks and plazas, pocket parks and parklets along the sidewalks. And again, that public square at the Eden Center for programming and festivals. We're also looking at architecture, what can be done there, welcoming ground floor, storefronts and outdoor seating. Next slide, please. We're also looking at gateway features. These could be um, branding features and unique signage and public art. And that feeds into public art. We're also looking at a festival for local art, maybe a mural festival to get some murals up on the East End. Um, we're also looking at a mural on the Fairfax Water Tower. Also looking into creative placemaking. This could be performances and festivals, um, perhaps at the Eden Center Public Plaza. Um, also looking at wayfinding, again, Vietnamese street signage around the Eden Center area and wayfinding signage as the area redevelops. Next slide, please. All right, this is our chapter six, our multimodal connectivity and accessibility chapter. It starts off by listing some current obstacles in the area, such as long block links, wide streets, narrow sidewalks, unsafe crossings, a lack of bicycle infrastructure and expansive parking lots. We also look at upcoming projects, again, that BRT, the Envision Route 7, um, and the Fairfax County Ring Road. The chapter explores our recently completed East End Transportation Study done by Nelson Nygaard. Next slide, please. These are some images that are pulled from that study for the East End, um, one of which is a proposed street network. Next slide, please. All right, we're gonna skip over this slide as well. Next slide, please. All right, these are our strategies. Okay, so we begin with improving street grid and adding some greener paths. We also wanna treat Wilson as a great street. We wanna add more bus stops. We also wanna promote Metro Rail first mile, last mile connections. And we wanna see new roads to offer street parking. Next slide, please. This is our final chapter. This is our environment and utilities chapter. So I just want to begin with some existing environmental conditions and challenges within the East End. The tree canopy is very limited within the East End. There's only 110 trees in the entire POA. We're looking to change that with this plan. We also have the issue of stormwater. This area is dominated by impervious surfaces, such as parking lots. 78% of the POA is impervious. This increases the heat island effect in the area. This also brings an increased opportunity for environmental degradation due to stormwater runoff. Next slide, please. All right, so this gets into some strategies um, to ultimately provide climate action and mitigation efforts in the area. So here we're looking at urban forestry tactics and best management practices for stormwater and building and site design. Could we incorporate lead as development occurs? Can we also incorporate urban agriculture such as community gardens? We've, we've heard a lot about garden space being included in the East End. Next slide, please. Also looking at infrastructure reliability as we move towards the future. So looking to coordinate with Fairfax Water. Also looking at undergrounding overhead wires and aiming for net zero. Next slide, please. 
This is our next steps. So we're returning to city council with the revised plan in early February. We also return back here to the planning commission with the revised plan in mid-February. Currently, we have a tentative action for planning commission and the city council in March. Once adopted, the East End Small Area Plan will serve as a guide for public and private projects to promote and protect the needs of current and future city residents, workers, and visitors too. Next slide, please. This is just our vision for the East End once again. I'd like to live, leave you all with this. Um, this is what we see the East End becoming in the future, the near future. Um, so I just want to leave this before we open up the public comment slide. Thank you. My turn again, or do you have any comments? Oh, all set. Uh, again, on behalf of uh, my fellow planning commissioners, we want to welcome everyone who's taken the time to come here this evening. Um, your uh, comments are important, and we look forward to, uh, to hearing them. Uh, planning is a pretty important part of what the Planning Commission does. In fact, uh, the state of Virginia requires it of planning commissions throughout the state. Uh, but it only works well when it fairly reflects a consensus of what the people who live and work in the particular area that's being planned uh, have in mind. Uh, so that's why you're here this evening. And again, we're, we're very, uh, uh, very anxious to hear your comments and incorporate what you have to think in future drafts of the plan. I'll just add one other thing, and that is these plans are aspirational. There's no obligation on the part of developers to, to follow them, although we hope that they will. We hope that it'll provide guidance uh, in the types of developments that uh, eventually you know, we would all like to see. Um, but again, this is not lawmaking. This is just, uh, just setting guidance. And so with that, Mr. Trainer, I will ask you to go ahead and start to call uh, people who are here in the room for uh, three minutes of comments. All right, thank you, Chair. Um, our first speaker tonight is Casey Utley, followed by Amanda Luo. Gotcha. Thank you. Uh, my name is Casey Utley, and I'm here with Showing Up for Racial Justice Northern Virginia. Like many folks who are here tonight, we are deeply grieved by the so-called improvement plans that could displace and disrupt a thriving community. Our local governments love to point out the diversity of our area when it serves them, but this is a real opportunity to demonstrate solidarity with the business leaders and Viet community that have built this area. We support the organizers calling for you to directly and vigorously consult affected Vietnamese community members and prioritize protecting them from displacement and rent hikes. You say you want public gathering spaces where the community can be strengthened, but that's already happening at Eden Center. Turning this into an area or that's a space that's more palatable to rich white people is cultural erasure. Gentrification is violence. The Viet community is speaking and telling you what they want, and I hope you'll listen. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker is Amanda Luo, followed by Quinn Nguyen. Good evening, Planning Commission. My name is Amanda, and I'm with the Viet Police Collective, which aims to uplift and uphold the legacy of Vietnamese culture, community, and identity in the DMV for the next generation. I'm a Northern Virginia native and lived on Wilson Boulevard for a couple years, and my family and I frequently patron the small pockets of Asian cultural centers and businesses in the DMV area. We're also too familiar with the gentrification and erasure of Asian communities in major cities across the U.S. over the past couple decades, like in Chinatown, D.C. Historically, economic growth brings rising rent, local, dis local businesses are displaced, national chains move in, and while they may include Asian business signage, the people and culture are absent. These neighborhoods lost their charm that made them so desirable for development in the first place. This already happened in Little Saigon down the street, where the local Viet community was displaced in the 80s with the development of Clarendon Arlington. In Falls Church, it's obvious that the East End's main attraction is the Eden Center. In fact, it brings in almost $2 million in tax revenue to the city, according to the Falls Church News Press in 2009. I have fond memories exploring new stores and hanging out at the Eden Center with my family and friends. 
For my Vietnamese friends, it's a priceless cultural cornerstone for multiple generations. Eden has remained true to its Vietnamese roots from those who were displaced many times before, but that may all change if we do not remain vigilant. I want reinvestment and improvements to the poor infrastructure, to the lack of a proper gathering space, to the dangerous roads. The people at Eden make do with what they have, but they deserve so much more. Buildings that aren't falling apart, a safer and more welcoming space, and better accessibility. The local Vietnamese community deserves so much more. And that's why I'm asking the City of Falls Church to prioritize legacy business programs and build economic resilience through anti-displacement, business literacy, and legal aid programs now before development. I'm also asking to limit displacement by developing specific special exception criteria to preserve the small businesses now before it's too late. In Chapter 4 and 5 of the Economic Plan, there's concern for displacement, but we've yet to see any urgent action. Legacy business programs and anti-displacement strategies are non-negotiables, not optional additions to economic development. We're in control to prevent history from repeating itself again, and we have the power to take action to prevent displacement in Falls Church now. Thank you for your time this evening. Our next speaker is Quinn Nguyen. Thank you. And just before you start, I just want to indicate that the actual timing light is on that uh, podium over there. So I'm sorry I didn't mention that. But uh, please go ahead, sir. Followed by. Go to that podium or? Okay. Uh, Tang is our next speaker following. Hi. Can you hear me? Okay. Hi. Um, hi, my name's Quinn. I'm also with Viet Place Collective. You just heard our mission, so I won't say it again. <laughs> I was born and raised in Nova. Um, I grew up going to Eden Center with my family. And I'm here today to tell the East End Small Area Planners that I believe you need to do much more outreach to the Vietnamese community about your plan before you move forward with it. The first time I heard of this plan was after I heard, the, the first time I learned of this plan, I'm sorry, was after I heard a rumor that Eden was going to get torn down. One of my very first requests to the planners was that if no one on your team speaks Vietnamese, you should hire someone who does to give factual information and to get input from Eden's business owners and workers about this plan. What you had said in return was that you were going to hold pop-ups and a community meeting, which you even note in your plan's economic development chapter as unlikely for business owners to attend. Then in November, I was frustrated to find out that your planned pop-up at Eden never happened, your survey then was only in English, and you released the Vietnamese flyer for the community meeting only nine days before it was going to happen. So I spread the word online, I gave you contacts of a few local Viet media outlets, and, and a well-known Vietnamese um, community advocate and I distributed the Viet flyer ourselves to many of Eden's long-standing small businesses. We took the time out of our weekday afternoons to do the work that you should have done weeks before. We were received warmly because we spoke in Vietnamese and we went um, during a time when they weren't busy. 3 to 5 p.m. is a good time to go, by the way. Um, some owners even offered to take multiple copies so that they could spread the word to their fellow neighbors and customers. But all the people I talked to said they had heard of the plan several months ago but haven't heard anything about it since. None of them knew that that November community meeting was happening. What I heard from them confirmed my suspicions that you all weren't engaging them in this process. If you had assumed that information might trickle down from Eden's manager, Mr. Alan Frank, to the tenants, then that hasn't been happening. Are these small businesses not um, the most vulnerable to displacement due to development and jacked up rent? Are they not the people holding the Vietnamese culture that's the focus of your plan? I think the businesses that establish the vibrant culture in your city deserve proper outreach. Outreach is effective when you meet people where they're at rather than making them come to you. Um, you could have held the town hall kind of event at Eden. You probably could have held this part at Eden. Um, you also got to show them that you care about what they have to say by doing outreach often, using language that they can understand. And this isn't the first time you've heard this suggestion. Mr. Hira had recommended the same thing back in December 2021. So if you haven't already, please hire a Vietnamese-speaking outreach specialist to spread the word more effectively in our community. That way, you can directly consult the people most impacted by this plan, Eden's Viet business owners and workers, to include their vision for the East End too, not just the landlords. I hope that you'll make more time to get their input and make a seat for them at the decision-making table. Um, without adequate Vietnamese input to a plan that wants to celebrate Vietnamese culture, at best your placemaking could turn the so-called East End into an Orientalist Disneyland, and at worst, you'll continue the cycle of city-approved development driving out Vietnamese businesses. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Ad Tang, followed by Tam Trinh. 
Good evening, Planning Commission. My name is Ha, and I am a, a part of Viet Place Collective. I'm a first generation Vietnamese American who immigrated to Virginia at the age of two, thanks to the sponsorship of my uncle who came here after the fall of Saigon in 1975. As you all are aware, there's a big Vietnamese community here in Northern Virginia, and we gather to Eden Center no matter where or how far we live. My family and I moved to Sterling a few years ago, yet we drop by Eden weekly to buy items my family claim isn't good elsewhere, such as banh mi from banh mi Zomo, or dan tau ho from tan so and tofu. I am here today to ask you if the city has done its due diligence to inform and engage with the Vietnamese community about what is being planned. As Quinn mentioned, we started this group because we wanted to learn more about the misinformation regarding a flyer saying that Eden Center would be torn down last year. Then we researched this and wondered if shop owners and workers were aware of what was really happening. In January of last year, my friend and I went to Eden to talk to a few owners and workers to see if they knew the plan. Owners brought up that they haven't heard anything about this from the landlord, and workers were worried that they may lose their job if things were going to be rebuilt or torn down. In November, Quinn uh, did outreach to the community meeting. It is frustrating to receive Vietnamese translated flyers a little over a week before the November meeting and to think that suddenly people will find out about this and attend. Our demand is that the city hire fluent Vietnamese speaking outreach specialists and be able to consistently meet with people, build trust with the community so they are comfortable in giving input and engaging with you. In May 2022, the Eden Center received an official Virginia historical marker thanks to siblings Griffin and Oliver Hardy at the Mary Ellen Henderson Middle School because they wanted to recognize Vietnamese immigrants for their contribution in the Commonwealth's history. We ask that you recognize the contribution of our Vietnamese community as well and hire a Vietnamese speaking outreach specialist who can ensure that these business owners and workers can continue their growth, understand and not worry about becoming displaced if renovations take place in the area and rent starts to rise. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Tam Trin. No, okay. Our next speaker is Jen Tran. Who understands speaking um, for herself and also has a message from her father. Hi, my name is Jen Tran. I'm a longtime resident of Falls Church. I wanted to take some time to share some voices from the community that aren't here tonight. Um, you know, there's a lot of young Viet people here, but we are missing the voices of our elders who built Eden Center and haven't always felt welcome in the public process. It's not that they don't care or they don't have opinions. Uh, most of the people over 50 who weren't business owners had no idea the city had any plans. Um, many of them prefer to stay anonymous, so these are some of their words. One mother shared, I do not want to see residential buildings because it will cause prices to rise. If Eden Center had new developments, I would feel sad and disappointed because Eden reminds me of my homeland and making it look like mosaic would lose that. Another said, I want more parking spaces and an Asian style garden with a playground so the families, children and elderly can meet and play. I don't want American stores in the center. American stores can be found easily everywhere else. Another said, I don't want to see mom and pop shops that have been there forever to be driven out by raising rent costs. What's special is the sense of community and feeling like there's a little part of Vietnam in the States. Lastly, I'd like to share a part of a conversation I had with my father, Kevin Gui Chun. We've lived in Falls Church for almost 20 years, and um, we care a lot about the community. So this clip starts after we discussed the city's proposal for 10 to 20, tw 10 to 12 story mixed use buildings. Um, I'm not sure what the planners mean about small scale, um, senior residential, but the last community meeting, there was talk of 10 to 12 story buildings. I wouldn't really call those small scale. Let's see if we can get this to work. How would you feel if Eden Center started to look like that? They started to build the high rise, mosaic, founders row type. Not only the high rise or the, the new shop, but the Vietnamese will, will be pried out of that area the rent will increase. Whether you get choice or you don't get choice, the existing building to dry down the community that create the identity for that, that center. Because they may say, oh, yeah, 
ah, Moisés look cool. But they forget that Moisés look cool, but not for real me. It look cool for some big company with big money. It not happen overnight, but eventually. <laughs> yeah. Look at what happened in Clarendon. Think about that. Alan is the owner. And he will claim that because that center is bring more people to this area, I entitled to raise your rent too. I think the city sees Eden Center and they just see a huge parking lot. But don't they see that it packed every weekend and you couldn't find the parking? Yeah, a lot of people said that there's not enough parking, but the city seems to think that there's too much parking and that they could use it for something else. The city need to have empty space. You cannot like put high rise building everywhere that you see open. And Founders Row is so close to the street, it feels very claustrophobic, right? Right now, Fortress City is always like that. You travel along Route 7, you see any open space anymore? No. So instead of that, instead of building something like big and, and tall and shiny and thing, why don't you give the owner incentive? Hey, if you modernize your existing center by upgrade what you have, but keep the tunnel, we will give you incentive. Not to fake lips. Eden Center in the way that change the identity and the joy in the building behind that. This is where the community, where my community, no matter what happened, I have to stick with it. A lot of people are concerned about displacement. Uh, if you don't know about Little Saigon, I encourage you to look into the Echoes of Little Saigon project um, about Clarendon in the 80s. There are tools to prevent this from happening again. Things like grandfathering in rent rates and requiring minimum occupancy ratio for minority business owners and committing funding to these legacy building business preservation programs, not just talking about them. It's just whether the city is willing to demand that of the developer in their special exception requirements. We want more than nice words. We want commitment to action. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Truce Man Nguyen, followed by Charlie Lord. Hi, my name is Duk Mi. Um, I'm here representing myself. I'm 100% Vietnamese, and uh, my family immigrated here about two decades after the war in Vietnam, and I was born and raised in Northern Virginia. Um, I grew up going to the Eden Center a lot, and it means a lot to me and the people that I care about. Um, I want to thank the city and the planners for having these listening sessions to hear our community with the intention to enact change. I want to thank the allies that are here for the Viet community, and I want to thank the Viet folk that are here today and joining us virtually as well among you, and thank you for your support. Um, so we've already heard a lot about how to better support, include, and invest the Vietnamese community here and beyond, and I say beyond because what happens at the Eden Center here has implications beyond what happens with the local community. It is the largest and most substantial Vietnamese cultural hub on the East Coast, which means people travel here from all across the East Coast. People travel here from across the US because Eden Center is a Vietnamese cultural hub. And I just wanna talk a little bit about how crucial it is to preserve Vietnamese culture specifically and prevent it from becoming a broader Asian hub. Since people come to the Eden Center because it is a Vietnamese cultural hub, um, the create, making it an Asian hub with um, unintentional development uh, without considering the culturally specific nuances of redevelopment can lead to Vietnamese cultural erasure. And when you see a Vietnamese cultural erasure happening with the Eden Center, that means less businesses, um, less people coming to the Eden Center, which means less tax dollars for the city as well. And it's not only dangerous because of the loss of business, because of the loss of tax dollars, it's dangerous because what we're risking here is cultural erasure not on just a local level, but Vietnamese cultural erasure on a national level, in the level of the United States. And Vietnamese cult the future of Vietnamese cultural preservation or the future of Vietnamese cultural erasure rests in the hands of a lot of people in this room. It rests in the hands of the city of Falls Church. It rests in the hands of the planning commission. It rests in the hands of the folks working on the redevelopment team. And it rests in the hands of Alan Frank and his property management team. And it's overtly racist to deny the depth and the richness of Vietnamese culture in the area which is why I urge folks to consider renaming Wilson Boulevard to Saigon Boulevard and the area 
to Little Saigon, and we cannot truly claim to honor the contributions of the Vietnamese community here until Vietnamese culture is symbolically cemented. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Next speaker is Charlie Lord, followed by Victor Nguyen Long. Hello, good evening. I'm Charlie Lord. I live at 222 Little Falls Street. I've been going to and loving Eden Center since I was a high schooler in the mid-90s. Uh, the experience of growing up here in Falls Church was immeasurably enriched by having Eden Center here. I'd like to um, comment on two things I've heard so far that the city or the, it's been stated so far by the city or, or representatives here. First, the idea that a small area plan is merely aspirational is not true. And the city of Falls Church writ large needs to be more honest with its citizens, with affected people about what a comprehensive plan is. A small area plan is part of the comprehensive plan. Perhaps the city of Falls Church could start quoting the way the Falls Church Planning Division uh, describes a comprehensive plan on their landing page, which is, the comprehensive plan is required by state law to be used as a guide to decision making about the natural and built environment by the county's board of supervisors, in our case, the city council, and others, such as the planning commission and the board of zoning appeals. It has legal effect, it guides future decisions and future land use uh, amendments, and it also very much affects the marketplace. Savvy developers know that it, they, they will look at a comprehensive plan and how it treats a property before they make a speculative land purchase because they know the permitting process is going to be greatly eased if, this, if the comprehensive plan calls for more dense development. I also wanted to correct something in the presentation that suggested that Little Saigon ended because of the construction of the metro in Clarendon. Uh, that's not true. Uh, it was displaced because of redevelopment. And as a previous speaker said, and I highly commend to you, the website Echoes of Little Saigon, which was put together by students from the Virginia Tech Department of Urban Planning, and it reflected a detailed oral history study of the rise and the demise of the Little Saigon neighborhood in Clarendon. It talks about the way that the South Vietnamese community came here as refugees. It talked about the way that they were able to find, at a time that the metro was being constructed in Clarendon, suppressed rents, and it allowed them to get an economic foothold in that community, a toehold, and their first step towards the American dream. And then it talks about how three dozen businesses were there. And then in 1989, this is what happened. Arlington County approved uh, the redevelopment plan. And here I'll just read to you the stuff that's cited from their oral history study. Uh, that redevelopment plan envisioned high-rise commercial structures, mid-rise residential buildings, and pedestrian walkway. Now, interestingly, and keep this in mind as you're thinking about small business displacement avoidance, that plan proposed incentives for constructing buildings lower than the zoning code allowed and for carving out smaller scale commercial sca spaces for smaller scale businesses, and it did not work. Rents went up and the Vietnamese enterprises were displaced. Um, the business owners began shopping for new shopping center places, uh, and the businesses that remained behind showed that the once they'd struggled because the once large crowds of Vietnamese customers dwindled and the neighborhood's value as a community meeting ground diminished. Uh, as described by a former customer and community activist, it was hard for these refugees to lose their community after just recently losing their country. County planners noted the inevitability of pressure on small businesses, explaining the government had discussed plans for many years to turn Clarendon into a higher density mixed-use corridor. And now only one of the original businesses remain. Let's not let has history repeat itself. This is an opportunity, as was said, for Falls Church to demonstrate where it really stands on issues of history, culture, economic opportunity for small businesses, and inclusivity, or if what really matters is what was skipped over in the slide, which is a maximized floor area ratio. Thanks. Our next speaker is Doc, uh, Victor Nguyen Long, followed by Dr. Uh, Chi Connie Park. First of all, thank you for pronouncing my last name correctly. It's very important. Uh, my name is Victor Nguyen Long. Uh, I'm a member of Viet Place Collective, a group of concerned citizens uplifting and upholding the legacy of Vietnamese culture, community, and identity in the DMV for future generations. 
Uh, and I was born and raised in Arlington, where I recall uh, growing up and going to Little Saigon uh, in Clarendon and later Eden Center's opening even. Uh, while I genuinely appreciate the City of Falls Church's attempts to center Eden Center and its vision and mission uh, and its outreach, I'm here to ask the city to revise its vision and mission to specifically center Vietnamese people, culture, community, and identity, and specifically anti-displacement policy. Without the Vietnamese people, Eden Center is nothing but shoddy brick, mortar, and cracked asphalt. It is the Vietnamese people and the community that make it what it is, the number one tourist destination in the city of Falls Church, and one of the top tax revenue drivers. I am here to implore the city of Falls Church and the planning committee to explore every possible political, cultural, and legal tool to ensure that Vietnamese culture, community, and identity are preserved in the city of Falls Church, regardless of what capital commercial properties the Ebensteins and Alan Frank decide to do with the Eden Center property itself. I'm very careful not to conflate the small area plan uh, and the, the East End designation with that of, of Eden Center itself. I know, but they are inextricably uh, intertwined, uh, and thus we need to think about it holistically. When I attended the last community meeting, I asked about where the term East End came from, as I had never heard it, despite being uh, a, a local. I was told it was an entirely made up designation for POA uh, 5. With that in mind, I'm here, also here to ask that the City of Falls Church and the Planning Committee think much bigger than Eden Center itself and designate the entire quote unquote East End formally as Little Saigon or Little Saigon East to not only honor the people and community that have toiled to build the area to its prominence, but to think of the incredible regional marketing opportunities. When most people think of Little Saigon in Westminster, California, they think of the Asian Garden Market, also known as Phuc Lok Ta. But Little Saigon is much more than that, just that one mall. It is an expansive network known all over the world for its vibrant Vietnamese community and businesses. Designating the entire East End Little Saigon, as Little Saigon or Little Saigon East beyond just Eden Center could elevate Fall Church's profile nationally and internationally. This also creates pressure for capital commercial properties to maintain the Vietnamese makeup of tenants. The reality is that we know how it goes. To be clear, I'm not anti-development, and I only speak for myself and not Viet Place Collective. We all want the amenities proposed in the small area plan. They all sound great on paper, but we also have countless examples here in the region and all over the country of what happens. When development comes, rent prices go up, and the people that have been waiting for the safety, the convenience, the improvements, the longest are the ones that get pushed out, and they're not the ones who ultimately benefit from all these improvements. With new development and greater density, we know the big box stores and national chains are not far behind. Capital commercial properties have told its tenants, don't worry, it isn't, Eden Center isn't going anywhere. But what is noticeably absent is the mention of the Vietnamese businesses. When Eden Center itself may not go anywhere, there's little incentive for the Ebensteins to maintain an equitable, hospitable, and economically viable uh, environment. Money talks and things change really quickly when Safeway, Sephora, and Sweetgreen come with big checks. What we end up with, well, what we end up with is a clock tower and an ornate gate that says Eden Center, but is filled with American businesses with Vietnamese spelling. Sephora is a joke, but we've seen it happen in Chinatown, DC, right? And I mentioned, and I implore us to explore every anti-displacement mecha mechanism at our, disposable to, uh, at our disposal to prevent that from happening and actively prevent that from, uh, so that my children and my children's children can find community in Falls Church. Thank you very much. Okay. Our next speaker is Dr. Chi Connie Park followed by Isaac Roberts. Hello, my name is Dr. Chi Connie Park. I'm a community psychologist living and working here in Virginia and I conduct research and evaluation on federal public health initiatives. I'm also the daughter of Vietnamese refugees. My father was enlisted to fight for the South Vietnamese Air Force at the age of 19. He's not here tonight because he's watching my children so I can speak on his behalf. My father trained with the U.S. Air Force, and his main job was to evacuate wounded American and Vietnamese soldiers, a heavy job for a teenager. When, when Saigon fell, he and his family left everything behind and fled to America for safety. My father hasn't been back to Vietnam since he left, back in 1975. For him, there's too much that was lost, too many wounds that can't be healed. 
but he goes to Eden Center every week. He has now lived in America longer than he's lived in Vietnam. Eden Center has familiar sounds, smells, faces, and tastes that remind him of home. Last year, my five-year-old asked me why there are two flags in the middle of Eden Center, and why does Grandpa stand there, staring up at the flags for so long? Those two flags, the American flag and the flag of South Vietnam, which is also recognized by many states as the Vietnamese Heritage and Freedom Flag, side by side, they serve as a reminder of what was lost, but also symbolizes what lives on and a new hope here in America. The existence of Eden Center itself represents inclusion and belonging, a place of shared experience and understanding. Eden Center has deep cultural significance for a large population of Vietnamese Americans, some who came here as refugees, like my dad, and others like me and my kids who were born in this country. I have a couple of asks for you today. I urge you to please learn the personal stories and perspectives of those most impacted by any actions or plans that you're making for Eden Center. That means prioritizing and centering the perspectives and concerns of small business owners and the Vietnamese American community members, especially our elders, who come here for so much more than just good food. Authentic community engagement means involving stakeholders from day one, not once plans are drafted. We don't want to react to someone's vision for our community. We need to be part of that visioning process. So I ask you to please give the Vietnamese community a seat at the table so we can revitalize this community together in a culturally appropriate and respectful way. Thank you. Thank you. Isaac Roberts, followed by Valerie Nguyen. Press the button. Thank you. Uh, hello, my name is Isaac Roberts. Uh, I live in Arlington, Virginia. I live about five minutes just down the road on Wilson Boulevard from Eden Center. Uh, I'm going to keep it brief because I, I don't think my voice is what needs to be heard here. But um, I'm a recent, uh, I'm a new resident to the area. I moved here for work a few years ago. And um, I think, you know, in so much as I can represent the voice of uh, you know, privileged young professionals who are moving to the area, which I think is maybe the target demographic of a lot of these resources that are being talked about. Um, I think it is crucial that there is better involvement of the Vietnamese community that is here. Um, and I think that um, it's much more important not just to preserve but to support the community that is here rather than to um, try to uh, provide all of these developments. Um, just a, a quick anecdote. Um, one thing I know is that a good friend of mine moved to the area recently. He is Vietnamese, and uh, as much as I would have loved to believe he moved there to hang out with me, he said, I moved here to be close to Eden Center. It is a destination for a lot of people, and I think it's, it's very important, and I think that its cultural significance is understated in all of the materials that I've seen, and I hope that um, the City of Falls Church has the best of intentions and that those are better represented in the materials that they put forward. Um, that's all I have to say. Thank you very much. Thank you. Valerie Nguyen, followed by Mitch Chan. All right. <clears throat> Good evening to the Planning Commission. My name is Valerie Nguyen. I'm a lifelong resident of Northern Virginia, and um, though I just recently moved to Arlington, I have um, traveled to the Eden Center from as far as Woodbridge as often as weekly. Uh, so I hope you understand that its redevelopment in this proposed plan is personally relevant to me. Um, the draft plan includes a major decrease in parking availability with the proposed green space and infill housing development combined removing roughly a third of the current parking. This rezoning will almost surely lead to the catastrophic loss of business for all Eden Center tenants who rely on non-local customers commuting to the area to shop and dine. So the draft plan specifies the Eden Center buildings to be preserved in the redevelopment. I want to remind the commission that the Eden Center is, no, are, is not the ruins of an ancient civilization. It is a living, adapting, thriving community that's more than just the sum of its parts. It is the only Vietnamese cultural center of its kind within 50 miles of its location. 
the true value with the, which the commission seems to acknowledge in its own draft plan is in the businesses themselves and the people who shop and eat at them. With nowhere to park for customers to access the businesses, they will die. And when this happens and Chipotle and Starbucks move in, it will not matter whether the signs have Vietnamese translations, whether the arch remains or the roofs. The only connection to m many people who live in your city and in the surrounding areas have to their home country or their heritage or a culture they want to engage in will be gone. Now, I truly believe that the least harmful course of action for the commission is to draft a plan where more of the BJ's parking lot area it will be rezoned for the proposed housing project. If the commission is mostly committed to this design, I offer some strong suggestions and action items for the planning commission before this plan is sent to the city council. Firstly, I suggest the commission make a, uh, in their plan, a credible commitment to publicly available parking. The parking area can even be below the proposed housing development as a garage, or it could be part of the town square concept, sorry, in the neighboring node. But it must be public and it must be accessible to customers of Eden Center. Secondly, I request that any further drafts of the proposed redevelopment plan include credible, uh, specific credible commitments and programs related to the displacement assistance that tenants are supposed to receive. Commitments from the City of Falls Church are outlined in the current draft plan and may also include small business grants or services identified by the Small Business Anti-Displacement Network. Lastly, my largest action item, sorry I'm running out of time here, is for the Commission to perform and publish this to the public an economic impact statement of the draft plan on current businesses and nearby residents of the Eden Center. This assessment should include interview data regarding the positive components of Eden Center as it is from current tenants and model data on the possible business loss with the, the proposed changes. I urge the Commission to consciously avoid the repeating the tragedy of gentrification of the former Little Saigon in Clarendon. Preservation is not the answer, it's investment, community buy-in, and promotion. Please do more to engage resource users, such as the tenants and employees, in their own language with technology they can use, not QR codes and yard signs written only in English. Please ask them what they need and what they want before you move forward, or the city may perpetuate yet another injustice on the Vietnamese community in Virginia. Thank you for your time. Thank you. All right, next we have Mitch Chan, followed by John Mai. Second. Uh, hi, everybody. Um, my name is Mitch Chan. I am the organizing team lead at Homke Center. Uh, Homke Center is a community organization with offices in Annandale and Centerville. We work with Asian American communities throughout Northern Virginia to achieve racial, economic, and social justice. Um, while we have not been directly organizing with uh, many of the largest uh, Asian American ethnic groups that would be directly impacted by the East End Area Small Plan, um, especially the Vietnamese Americans. So we're really grateful the Viet Collective is actually doing this work, doing this really important outreach. We have heard about the challenges that residents and workers at the Eden Center face via our direct services program. Moreover, we are aware of the challenges in other parts of the countries that Asian Americans have faced in advocating for communities and planning and redevelopment conversations. Um, while the draft vision statement with goals um, seem to offer exciting opportunities for Falls Church that leverage existing strengths, we have many concerns as well. Uh, concern number one, goal one seeks to preserving the Eden Center. Chapter three further details preservation expansion is mainly maintaining existing buildings. However, the issue at hand is the buildings are not in great shape. They're terrible shape, as some of you people have already mentioned. Um, tenants have long struggled over building conditions such as poor air quality and sewage uh, issues. There needs to be more than mere maintenance. We echo the calls of the Viet Collective that this is an opportunity to not only preserve, but improve existing buildings, hold the land order accountable. The next two concerns speak to the lack of language accessibility, uh, culturally relevant outreach that has been done in regards to this plan, or rather not been done. Goal one, um, our concern number two is that goal one speaks to preserving the cultural identity and recognizes how Vietnamese Americans have transformed this site to a booming economic engine for the entire region. Um, therefore, the city should ensure that Asian, uh, Vietnamese Americans can be fully involved in this process. This means meaningful and consistent engagements in Vietnamese and, uh, in Vietnamese and potentially other languages besides English. Our understanding is, is that until the Viet Collective organized on the matter, even getting the flyers translated into Vietnamese was not a given. They had to push, and that's not okay. 
Um, concern number three, chapter four, um, discusses strategies of legacy business preservation programs and uh, limit displacement of small businesses. Humke Center supports this. Um, language access is key to implementing these strategies. Already, the Vietnamese American community experienced ma massive displacement from Little Saigon in Clarendon. Once again, we did not see and want to see culturally relevant, um, culturally relevant and linguistically relevant outreach to existing businesses. Uh, concern number four, chapter three, discusses the potential of adding a, fo a food hall next to Eden Center. The city is also planning for retail and residential high-rise development that seems similar to what we see at Mosaic District. Uh, what are the concrete steps that the city will take to ensure that the community members who own businesses can keep their businesses there? What are the concrete steps that the city will take to also ensure that the residents in the area will also be able to continue living in the area? because it is precisely this kind of development that increases rents, commercial and residential, throughout a neighborhood and leads to displacement. In addition, this will crowd out plans for additional public spaces that are green for, for community con connections. Finally, um, we're also asking that um, you guys consider the potential dangers to pedestrians. Um, we know many groups have bought this public attention. Um, uh, um, last month, with Lee, I might be saying this name wrong, I don't have, um, uh, forgive me, um, was killed when she was walking on the Leesburg Pike close to Bailey's Road. She was walking on the shoulder of the world because there were no sidewalks available. Immigrants are disproportionately at risk for fatal accidents because of this area's limited sidewalks, lack of pedestrian cross signs, um, and high driving speeds as reasons for fatal accidents. Um, so we're asking that you actually take those into consideration realistically, not just in words. Thank you. Thank you. John Mai, followed by Aaron Flynn. Good evening to everyone on the board and good evening to everyone in the room. Not that it's important, but my name is John Mai and the city has a special place in my heart. I went, I attended elementary school at St. James Elementary School down the road. I would attend all the, you know, 4th of July parades on West Broad Street, Easter egg hunts at Cherry Hole Park. I even taught at the Junior Institute and empowered the youth and taught people how to defend themselves. And of course, Eden Center is my second home. So I'm disappointed as a local and member of the Vietnamese community, not at your intentions, but at the plan in its current state, because it's unclear to me if we were included in this planning, because I do not know a single person clearly in this room who is for it. When we want to help others, we ask people how they want to be helped, not how we want to help them. One demonstrates a fundamental level of understanding, respect, consideration, and cooperation. The other actually hurts the people that we want to help. The current plan would gentrify Eden Center and the housing around it by driving up the prices of rent and which will displace Vietnamese businesses and owners, which will displace Vietnamese business owners in the area. These businesses are crucial not just as millions in tax revenue to the city of Falls Church, but also as an important cultural icon to its diversity and inclusivity. Did we install a historical landmark last year or did we install a future grave marker? That's been on my mind. I love this city and I grew up and I think there's a fundamental misunderstanding that Eden Center is a physical location instead of it being a home to many in our hearts. Eden Center does not exist because of its existing structures and lion statues guarding the gates. It's Eden Center because that's where our people and businesses are. Please reconsider. And to be honest with you, I didn't intend to come up here tonight, but I feel obligated on behalf of my community, my friends who couldn't be here, and the members of our community whose voices won't be heard. My parents crossed an ocean to be here so I don't have to run. You're not just threatening the livelihood of Eden Center. You're also th threatening my existence and what many of us call home. Once again, please consider, reconsider. Thank you, and I yield my time. Thank you. Aaron Flynn is our last uh, in-person registered commentator. If anyone else is in the room that would like to speak, please um, fill out a slip and come see me. Is the button pressed on your mic there? There Got you it. go. Thank you. <laughs> I'm Aaron Flynn. I live at 222 Little Fall Street, and I'm here tonight to show my support for the immigrant business community at Eden Center. Um, members of the Vietnamese community are rightfully concerned about what the city envisions for the East End. Um, most aren't city residents, they're not property owners, and they have little political or economic influence over this process. 
for all the work that's gone into this plan, the public comments, and I'm you know, mostly referencing the written comments in the packet, but also the comments tonight, reflect that the Vietnamese community feels left out and is apprehensive, and that's without even seeing the 800 plus discrete comments that accompanied survey responses and have been reduced to a few sentences in the survey sort of um, summary. I think this plan, even more than other small area plans, needs to be realistic. And the reality is that redevelopment drives up costs, that construction is extremely disruptive, and that infill of the Eden Center parking lot will choke minority businesses. If the city is serious about preserving the Eden Center, it should commit to taking concrete steps to ensure that the businesses stay afloat. Last year, we saw council approve the movie theater deal to give city residents something that wasn't economically feasible. Personally, I think it's far more important to preserve Eden Center than to have a movie theater. The small area plan anticipates doubling East End revenue through redevelopment. Given additional revenue streams, the city should examine how it can redirect tax revenue that comes specifically out of Eden Center to go back into a capital improvement fund for the businesses there, to fund small business grants, and to assist with any disruption from nearby construction. Some council members have said that we shouldn't subsidize private business, but we now have recent precedent for doing so, and this seems like a prime example for where it's actually appropriate. The city also should examine possible zoning protections like a special overlay district or pres preservation easements to protect Eden Center. Ms. Baysmore um, referenced New York Chinatown and San Francisco, China, San Francisco Chinatown, and both of those have Chinatown and Lower East districts and the Chinatown area plan. Those communities aren't intact because of San Francisco and New York's goodwill. They had to fight to keep their communities against um, constant redevelopment pressures. In conclusion, the city needs to readily acknowledge the economic pressures that risk squeezing out immigrant businesses to ensure Eden Center and the Vietnamese community critical to its success persist in the face of redevelopment. If the city doesn't take concrete steps now, this is bound to go the way of DC Chinatown where there's ample Chinese characters but few Chinese businesses or DC Union Market where the immigrant wholesale businesses are closing shop. In sum, the city must be prepared to put its money and its resources where its mouth is as far as meaningful support to this community. Thank you. Thank you. Did we receive any other comments, requests? No, that's all the in-person comments. We have a couple uh, remote um, commentators. Okay, if you'd like to proceed with that. Sure, our first one's uh, Sophia Nguyen. If you wanna un unmute Sophia and you'll have three minutes to speak. Hello and xin chào. First and foremost, I apologize for not being there in person as I am currently recovering from my wisdom teeth surgery, but thank you all for allowing a virtual platform so that I can speak during this meeting. My name is Sophia Nguyen. I'm a current student at George Mason University and my family have been constant customers to the Eden Center since they opened in 1984. While some go about once every week, others go about every other week, simply to purchase Vietnamese food and items that they cannot find anywhere else. We go there to eat at restaurants with friends and family to celebrate Lunar New Year, which is happening this weekend, but most importantly, we go because there is a wonderful community there. After I heard about the development plan that the City of Falls was proposing, Falls Church was proposing, I knew that the slimmest possibility of the erasure of Eden Center would crush my family. Therefore, I knew I had to speak up for them. Vietnamese owners have earned their place at Eden Center. They deserve every right to continue working at Eden Center without having the burden of thinking about increased rent or being forcibly removed from their source. In fact, I was shocked to hear that there was a development plan in the works when we should actually be focusing on the current demands of our Vietnamese businesses. For one, Eden Center deserves to have increased security as there have been recent news of theft and vandalism. There needs to be more parking availability as it is currently compact and extremely dangerous for little kids. Businesses have been constantly asking for assistance and renovating the stores, but have been ignored by the landlord despite him drastically increasing rent, which has already caused stores to be closed down. 
As far as I'm concerned, the landlord and the city of Falls Church have not taken the needs of the Vietnamese businesses into consideration and it absolutely needs to be addressed. I demand that the city of Falls Church directly include Vietnamese business owners and prioritize their opinions and ideas for the area and the development plan. Please update them on every step and always prioritize their needs first. If language barriers are an issue for you all, hire a Vietnamese speaking outreach specialist to make communications more easy and effective. I also demand that you prioritize preventing displacement of Vietnamese businesses while improving building conditions and public spaces like they have been asking for several years. This development plan will only add more issues to the pre-existing issues that our Vietnamese businesses are already having, and we all know that they only want to work to provide for their families and make our community feel at home. Without the Eden Center, we will not have a cultural gathering place for the Vietnamese community. It truly is a convenient place where we can get all of our errands done at one place. And most importantly, we, the Vietnamese community, have a sense of belonging to the Eden Center that we do not want to get rid of ever. Thank you, and I yield my time. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Christina Din. Hi, my name is Christina Din, and I am a daughter of Vietnamese refugees and immigrants, and Eden Center has been a part of my family and cultural heritage for as long as I can remember. I grew up in Connecticut, and I would come to visit Eden Center with my family almost annually. That's a seven hour drive, by the way. I currently live in the DMV area, and while I have fond memories of Eden Center stemming from childhood, I want to take this opportunity to also express the importance of Eden Center to people like my parents and extended family, but also the broader immigrant Vietnamese community. I grew up with Vietnamese parents who were refugees from the Vietnam War and immigrated to the United States with barely anything. Imagine leaving all that you know, no possessions, no knowledge of the cultural norms, nor any English skills to help guide you on your way. Imagine the seemingly insurmountable struggles you might face, not to mention the judgment, the discrimination from those who lack the empathy or the patience to engage with you just because of your jilted English. As a first generation Asian American, I would regularly serve as a go-between and translator for my family and these are the struggles that I witnessed that my family along with several other immigrant Vietnamese people faced. Eden Center serves as a safe haven uh, for Vietnamese people to engage with others in their community without fear of judgment. It's a one-stop shop for all of your needs for example along with the various Vietnamese restaurants and grocery options if you had issues with taxes or were in need of legal advice you could find lawyers and accountants that spoke Vietnamese to serve your needs. Along the East Coast, Eden Center is well known throughout the Vietnamese community. My parents, after moving to Georgia, would still come up to Eden Center, even bringing their friends, because that is the pull that this area has. My ask for this committee is to be as inclusive and equitable to the business owners and broader Vietnamese community as possible by proactively engaging and directly consulting the Vietnamese business owners and workers in the vision of this plan. I agree with those who have spoken before me in the dire need for hiring a fluent Vietnamese outreach specialist to engage with business owners and members of the community. Um, I also ask that there be development of long-term sustainable and inclusive business plans that leverage the economic potential and invest in Eden Center with the Vietnamese business owners and community as the focal point and ensuring that the development does not displace nor disenfranchise the Vietnamese community. I do have concerns for the future of this area. If we look at DC's Chinatown area and the gentrification of that area, in the past, it had a large community of Chinese immigrants, yet they were eventually priced out and displaced. A developer's goal is to make profit, not protect communities. So I urge the committee to look at this as a cautionary tale and to put in safeguards in the plan where monitoring evaluation of displacement is continual so that adjustments can also be made. Uh, thank you to everyone, and I yield my, the rest of my time. Thank you. Is Elizabeth Somerville here? Elizabeth? Okay. Our next speaker is Phoebe Bui. Hi, everybody. 
My name is Phoebe Bowie, and I have lived in Maryland, first Bethesda, and now Laurel for my entire life. My family, my father's family are refugees from the Vietnam War, and our family has been going to Eden Center for over 30 years now. My Ong Noi, or paternal grandfather, is a longtime friend of one of the business owners in Eden Center. We would go to and still go to Eden Center at least once a, once a month, and Eden Center has been and continues to be a critical cultural hub for Vietnamese Americans such as myself. The first and priority goal of the small plan area is to, quote, preserve the Eden Center and its cultural identity. But what does this actually mean? In the FAQ, the draft plan outlines that it will, quote, support cultural identity. The plan uses placemaking tools and branding to further add to the Eden Center character, end quote. In the land use and zoning section, the plan states that, quote, the vision for this area is to preserve core existing structures, end quote. The goal definition funda fundamentally needs to be re-envisioned. The way to support or preserve Eden Center and its cultural identity is to support the Vietnamese people and their businesses in Eden Center, period. What brings people to Eden Center is not the structures, not the brand, but the people and the Vietnamese community itself. The small area plan needs to provide concrete and actionable next steps to prevent displacement, which has already happened once in Clarence, Virginia in the 1980s. Eden Center paid the city more than $1.3 million in property taxes. A proportion of those tax dollars must be reinvested into anti-displacement strategies. One way to identify such next steps or to preserve the existing Vietnamese businesses is to one, develop a clear culturally responsive outreach plan as suggested by the Viet Place Collective. Hire a Vietnamese bilingual outreach coordinator, have them identify the, biz the business owners and the workers, the community leaders, Meet them where they are at. Meet them when it's when it's convenient for them and in the language that they prefer. Ask them what their concerns are. The draft plan has already acknowledged a quote, generally low participa participation rate of POA businesses and owners in traditional community engagement forums and the planning commission needs to do better. Two, continue to research historically successful anti-displacement displacement strategies or allocate significant resources for a third party researcher to do this in its stead. And then finally, draft and highlight concrete anti-displacement strategies for the city, drawing both on Viet community voices and the research that you found. Additionally, the Planning Commission must ensure that the investment in public art supports a Vietnamese American artist and ideally a local Vietnamese American artist. I want to end by asking a question. And that is, what is the Planning Commission's plan or next steps to analyze and respond to the comments shared here and also past data collection efforts? We want to know that we're actually being heard and our comments are being taken into account and incorporated in this plan and not just being shelved after this. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Josephine Chu. Hi everyone, my name is Josephine um, and I'm a resident in Washington, D.C. I've lived in the D.C. area for over 11 years now. Um, my mom was born and raised in Vietnam in Saigon at the time with her family and she immigrated over to the United States with her family as refugees because of the Vietnam War. Um, because of this, I've always had a um, very close connection. We've always had a very close connection to Eden Center as a place where we could connect and um, get Vietnamese food and just really, um, especially for my mom and family to connect um, with other people. Um, and has, that's been really important uh, to connection um, and be able to connect, um, especially having, she has, ever since leaving Vietnam, she's never been able to return. Um, so um, I would echo what has been said by many other speakers here, I wanting to make sure um, in this, um, the importance of making sure that there is a um, Vietnamese outreach specialist to do outreach to the Vietnamese business owners um, and especially making sure to incorporate um, their demands and needs of the Vietnamese business owners and really making sure that their needs are heard, especially around uh, making sure that those businesses stay in place um, and what is needed in terms of making sure whether that be by um, rent control, rent civilization, so that they have what's needed, um, as well as the building renovations, any other needs that the business businesses need. Um, I think that's really critical. Um, 
just as you heard from many others, um, just the importance of its cultural significance as well as, um, as already heard, the large economic impact of Eden Center and want to make sure that these um, Vietnamese business owners can continue to thrive into the future. Um, and I really think the government needs to do its part in making sure that as well. Um, and I yield my time. Thank you. Thank you. Our last speaker is um, Elaine NEM. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Elaine Yim, and I'm here by sheer luck of my Instagram algorithm showing me a post from the Viet Place Collective about what's happening. So I felt compelled to add a virtual comment today, so thank you for that opportunity. I currently live in DC, but spent most of my years growing up in Maryland. Eden Center is a way for my parents to connect with the Vietnam they had to leave behind. It is a way for my parents to show me a small sliver of the Vietnam they knew. My parents still make the trek to Eden Center from Montgomery County, Maryland, almost every other week to grab everything they need. There is nothing else like this for them in the area. In the past, I've seen the impact of rising rent prices pushing out the businesses that are no longer at Eden Center. The storefronts have slowly been replaced by chains. I'm afraid if there's no proper plan in place, this trend will continue and be accelerated with the redevelopment plans. Those who can't afford the almost inevitable rent, rent price increase will only be chains and push out the small business owners who will not be able to make it financially work. However, this also presents an opportunity for the city to recognize the contributions of the Vietnamese community in this area with the previous suggestions um, by previous speakers, such as renaming roads or thinking about how to represent the Vietnamese community in the area. It presents an opportunity to also improve building conditions and public infrastructure as well, which in turn could help draw even bigger crowds that could not only help the businesses that exist there, but the city as well. Everyone who's ever done the trek from the metro station to Eden Center knows that walk is not the most pleasant or safest walk to there, even though it's about less than half a mile. Also, reiterating what previous speakers have suggested before, please hire a Vietnamese speaking outreach specialist to communicate and engage frequently with the business owners in Eden Center to identify ways to help, but also preserve the spirit of Eden Center. Without developing this plan that involves the people directly affected by it, you'll end up not only displacing those business owners, but indirectly us as well. Thank you. Thank you. And that's all the registered speakers we have. Okay, I'll, I'll just ask one more time, is there anybody else that would like to make a comment that's uh, here in the room before we close out our uh, listening session for this evening? Seeing none, then um, I'll call the listening session uh, to close. Uh, again, I wanted to say thank you all for spending your time uh, to bring us what I thought uh, were some very thoughtful comments. And no doubt staff and certainly ourselves as well as city council members will uh, try to absorb them as best we can and to um, work that into the next iteration of the plan. So uh, please stay engaged. Uh, your comments are very important. Uh, and uh, I, again, a welcome and, and good evening. So we can go, um, Mr. Stoddard, to the next item on the agenda, if you like. Sure, happy to do that. The, um, could, uh, wait, before, actually, could we have a little discussion amongst the planning commissioners before we have we, a work session tonight? It's on so we're going to hold. Yes, it's, it's for that purpose. Okay. <laughs> I, I just think the public that's here you might want to hear some of our reactions and thoughts, and I don't know if they want to sit oh, well, here through our Well, if you have something, please go meeting. ahead. Yeah. So. Do we? Well, one option is, is it too late to amend the agenda? Because I do think it would be fair to go straight to the work session, and I think, like, we either amend the agenda and go straight to the work session or just commit to moving really quickly through the next two items. Well, we have an agenda that we voted on. Um, I'm certainly open if anybody wants to make some comments. Uh, I think that's entirely appropriate. Uh, would that be acceptable if we allow for that? Thank you so much. Please stay. We're going to move as quickly as we possibly can through the next agenda, I hope, because this was incredibly meaningful 
and valuable to hear all of your comments. And I really want to take the time to kind of process them and reflect them. And we're going to do that in this working session. So if you can give just a little bit more of your time and stay to the end of this evening, I, I, I think that would be wonderful. Okay, thank you, Mr. Hira. Yeah, I just also want to say thank you so much for coming and giving all of your comments. Uh, it's so encouraging to see all of you and hearing about what the Eden Center means. And it's much more than a place, it's home place. And we've heard many of you say that. Um, and I don't know if that notion is really reflected. I don't think it's reflected in our small area plan as it stands now. And I really hope uh, that it gets closer to uh, a real comprehensive understanding of what this place uh, means to many of you, and not just you in the room, but people all around the country and all around the world. Um, and I'll just, one other comment though, is that I did suggest that we, when this thing started, that we had a listening session at the Eden Center. And I asked that there would be sufficient outreach to the small businesses. And I think it's pretty clear from all the comments that that was not done. Uh, and I think, I hope tonight, we can commit as a city uh, and a planning commission, um, and also as uh, the city planning department, that we will have a pop-up or a listening session at the Eden Center. Um, I don't think that's so hard to do. I think we should commit to it. Um, I'm disappointed that we haven't done it to date. Um, I mean, to have the pop-up at the farmer's market and not at the Eden Center, I mean, it doesn't make sense to me. Um, but, uh, you know, so I, I just hope that we incorporate all the comments that were said, but we get more comments. And we can, we know there is a lack of trust. There were rumors being spread that the Eden Center was going to be ripped down. So to dispel the myths, we've got to get to the people and we've got to talk to them. And I don't think we've done that sufficiently, but we are getting closer uh, by listening to all of you. But it's on us to get to the Eden Center to listen to many of the small businesses that were represented, their voices were represented, but they weren't here and we need to go to them. So thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? No comments? Mr. Grant? Okay. All right. All right. So I think that concludes our, um, our listening session <laughs> and speaking session. Um, so I think we can go on to the next item then, Mr. Stoddard. Sure. I'm happy to. Uh, one thing, I don't know, uh, Mr. Trainer, did we get uh, any receipt of petitions for items not on the agenda? Uh, none were submitted to me, um, and I don't believe we have any uh, virtual speakers speak on anything other than the, the East End Small Area Plan. All right. Uh, well, then we can roll into the next agenda item, which is your first action item of the night commission. Uh, it is uh, before you for action tonight, uh, as well as holding a public hearing. Uh, it is an amendment to the special exception conditions for the, uh, the Byron project. Uh, let me try to... Sorry, I wasn't ready for the context switch. Let me pull up my... Um my staff report here just to introduce the item before I turn it over to uh, Mr. Trainer, who's our uh, case planner on this one. Uh, this item before you, uh, uh, as I mentioned, it's a, uh, an amendment to the existing conditions on the, the Byron mixed-use development project uh, uh, on West Broad Street at Virginia Avenue. I'm sorry, Pennsylvania Avenue. Uh, you all have seen this material before uh, in a couple of work sessions, uh, and so this is before you tonight uh, for uh, public hearing as well as uh, um, your recommendation back to council. Uh, but with that, I'll turn it over to Mr. Trainer for his presentation. Thank you, Mr. Stoddard. Uh, we actually just received a petition to comment on the Byron. Um, I'm not sure if... Uh, w after we go through the staff report, we can, okay. we can accept the comment. Okay. Sure. Um, thank you, Mr. Stoddard, and good evening, uh, Chair and members of the Planning Commission. Um, you had a work session on this item just a couple weeks ago in late December the 21st. Um, so I'll just go through um, a couple of, of the changes that have happened since then. Um, I think the most uh, substantial comment uh, uh, given was about the parking management plan. Um, it was expressed that um, some of the 
Um, components of that plan could be simplified um, a little bit, particularly when it comes to um, some of the signage around the garage and the um, parking um, common area. The applicant has uh, submitted a revised um, plan, which um, I can pull up and um, uh, Mr. Andrew Painter is here on behalf of the applicant, um, who is Mr. Simon Lee. Um, I'll, I'll recognize uh, Mr. Uh, Painter in, in just a couple moments. Um, let's see. Uh, there was also, I want to uh, also recognize that there was a comment um, about the concern uh, about the potential to overregulate commercial uses um, and commercial leasing through voluntary concessions in the city. Um, and uh, our, our staff comment is that that's, that's noted. Um, the proposed amendment is consistent with more recent special exception approvals um, that have been made elsewhere in the city. Uh, these include commitments to commercial anchor uses, um, and they're important to the um, special exception pr uh, primary criteria um, and adding more flexibility in, in the remaining commercial spaces. Um, so, um, yeah, again, this is uh, the, the application is to expand. Uh, commercial uses in the two westernmost spaces in the Byron at 513 West Broad Street um, to expanding the uses to include all the, the uses allowable under the B1 zoning district um, except those expressly listed in the um, applicant's um, application which includes a list of, of items that um, you know are, are would not would not they're committed to not uh, putting in there. Um, again, in the um, uh, in the motion, we have uh, our recommendation is to approve the application or make that recommendation to council, um, who would take this up next Monday, the twenty third, um, for their work session. Um, and so uh, I think you know. With that, um, I'll I'll turn it over to uh, Mr. Andrew Painter, who can walk through um, the the PMP a little bit more. Um, and um, I, I don't know if we have. I don't think we have a formal app, uh, um, presentation. But uh, Mr. Painter, I can just bring up the revised PMP. I think that was kind of the the basis of the most substantial discussion. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much, Mr. Trainer, um, Mr. Chairman, and members of the commission. My name is Andrew Painter. Speaking on behalf of the Byron at Falls Church LLC, this is the en this is the uh, entity that is owned by Mr. Simon Lee, who is here with us this evening. Uh, this is dealing with the two ground floor commercial spaces at the Byron, the ones that are immediately adjacent to Howard E. Herman uh, Park. One is currently occupied by Acton Academy, and the other one has been vacant for about four years. Um, we appeared before you last month uh, as a preview and a work session item. Uh, we appreciated a lot of the comments. We've taken those back to the Condominium Association. Uh, Kathy Tige, who is the uh, president of the Condo Association, is here this evening as well. Um, and we have, uh, as Mr. Trainer said, made some modifications to the voluntary concessions. Uh, the greatest amount of change has come to the actual map that was included with the parking management plan. Uh, there is now additional signage. Uh, it is very clear where each sign is going to go. Um, and um, again, we have worked out the specific language with the condominium association that will be responsible permanently for uh, installing the signage, inspecting it, and maintaining it. Uh, we've been at this for several months. Uh, we have worked with staff um, uh, cooperatively, responded to each of its requests, uh, as well as the requests from members of council and, of course, the commission. Uh, all that should be reflected in the materials before you this evening. Uh, I know there's a lot of people here this evening, and so uh, in the interest of time, I'll yield uh, my, my comments, but we would respectfully request your recommendation of support to council. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I think you said there was one public comment, Mr. Trainer. Yes. We can have that now. Uh, Dr. Allen Misnheimer. Hello. I'm uh, Alan Meisenheimer. I've been living at the Byron. Is your for, microphone on? Uh, are we on? Okay, it's on. Can you hear me? Yeah. I think, I think so. If you see the little light, you're good. Okay. Yep, I see it. Okay. <laughs> All right. I've lived at the Byron for about a year and a half. I've uh, lived in Falls Church for about 25 years. Uh, we know the committee, we know the city well, we love the city, we love living here. We're very happy to be uh, living in the Byron. Uh, we retired after a 35-year career in the State Department not too long ago, uh, and I appreciate the opportunity to come and comment on the proposal that the Commission is looking at with regard to parking and permitted uses for the commercial spaces on the ground floor. 
Uh, I have a general comment from my wife and me informally representing ourselves uh, about the parking and a rather specific comment about the permitted use proposal. Uh, with regard to the parking, the Byron Board is ideally situated and composed to deal with parking issues. I think they're doing an excellent job. The, the, uh, the board is well structured uh, and includes competent, hardworking, committed people who are keeping the community involved and are dealing with these issues. I urge the board to listen to the board. They do speak on behalf of the residents uh, and the, uh, the issues, the management issues uh, that are involved in this plan uh, seem to me the sort of thing that the Commission need not really involve itself in very much because I, I think the parking issues are being well managed as they are. Um, more specifically and more pointedly with regard to the change in permitted use, um, it's, uh, it's strange to my perception that the permitted uses for those commercial properties would uh, be proposed for change specifically to include, if I understand the proposal correctly, uh, to include the possibility of having a liquor store and a convenience store in those spaces. Uh, those were prohibited under the original uh, provisions for this mixed-use community. Uh, those are to be eliminated in this proposal. That makes no sense to us. Uh, it would not be compatible with the current existence of the Acton Academy in one of those commercial spaces certainly would not be compatible with the parking capacity and parking pattern that's available at the Byron. Uh, unfortunately, uh, those items have been proposed in, uh, have been included in this proposal, which from our standpoint makes the proposal unacceptable. Other aspects of it are unobjectionable, perhaps even unnecessary from our standpoint, but those permitted use changes would not be acceptable to us and are incompatible with the nature of the mixed use community and again with the current existence of uh, the Montessori School in the Byron. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Stoddard, do you have any comments on the uh, um, public comment, in particular the, the uses? Uh, sure, happy to speak to the, to the use question. So um, uh, the comment is correct that there is a proposed change in the list of um, restricted uses. Uh, the, uh, this, this idea of voluntarily restricting the uses goes back to, to some of the early special exception projects in the city. Uh, and uh, back then there was one sort of typical list of restricted uses that the city council was looking for. Uh, and over time that list has evolved. So some things that were on the list are no longer on it. Some things that weren't on the list now are. Uh, they're included in the staff report. If we can jump to line 387 in the staff report. Uh, when we get there, what you'll see in a red strike through uh, is the, um, the existing conditions, uh, 387 through 389, that's the existing list of, of restricted uses. Uh, and what's shown in uh, blue underline, blue bold underline, uh, in the lines following that is what's proposed. Uh, the, the blue bold underline is, is the list that um, has been used in the most recent special exceptions. Um, so I think staff's recommendation was to, to move to this, to this blue list because it is what the community has most often been using uh, recently. Okay. Um, well, our objective here tonight is to make a recommendation to uh, back to city council for uh, final action to be taken by them. So uh, at this point, I guess I'll open it up to uh, commissioners if you have any uh, comments to make regarding... Uh, the uh, proposed motion or any other thoughts that you have regarding uh, this issue? I, mean, I would just comment. I was not the work session, um, but I did review the proposal. And actually, I watched, I watched the recording of the work session. So um, I feel up, up to speed on, on the issue. Um, I mean, in general, I think, I, you know, I think one of the most telling aspects of this application, you know, on its face, you know, I think it gave me a little bit of pause. but. You know, when you consider the rental history, I mean, this is an applicant or who has, has a history of attempting to lease some of these spaces and struggled. And so I think bringing their permitted uh, tenants into line with what more recent developments in the city have been similarly restricted to and or allowed to, I think makes sense. I think it's fair. It's equitable. 
to bring this the buyer in into line with what similar more recent projects have been held to as far as the standard goes and and for that reason I'm comfortable with the proposal I'll, I'll be supporting it anyone else I, I just have one comment I mean the one use though that I know can be uh, an issue is is liquor stores um, and we have a lot of liquor stores uh, around and I'm just wondering is that a use um, that the owner or managing company is thinking of utilizing I could see the tenants who bought in thinking this use was restricted and then if a liquor store comes in they might um, have some objection to that and I'm just wondering why why isn't that because usually that's there right we usually prohibit that that's one of the prohibited uses often in our development deals right and liquor store is not there right and it was there but it got struck out and I guess what I'm saying is can't we just put in liquor store as the blue list because we just heard someone give testimony about maybe not wanting a liquor store there. Does that make sense? I don't know, you all are looking at me like I'm not making any sense. I, I think I am. That initially they couldn't have a liquor store. Under the original voluntary concessions, right. And, and now we're allowing but that. They've also, technically, but it's also been technically allowed at, at others. I mean, I think we have to realize, I mean, liquor stores, of course, are regulated by the Commonwealth, and we know where the existing ones are. There's one in the city. We used that, to have two. Have to be beer and wine. One. <laughs> two. Two in the city. Didn't one move out? Didn't the one that was in the city move out, and now it's in the county? The one that was in the that was in Birch and Broad, the ABC. Right, there, there used to be one over at Birch and Broad. Yeah. Right, and now that's relocated. That's to relocated. Yeah, outside the city limits. Right. So that's that, right. So I think we just have the one. Not that I drink that much. People probably come. I know where they all are. All the liquor stores, <laughs> but but uh, any, but anyhow, I mean, I guess, uh, and for me, I view it as just if, if we're not holding other founders row one and two and and other and you know brought in Washington to the similar type to, to that restriction I just would seem unusual to single out the this project unless there was a compelling reason to do that because of something about its location or its access or some other physical issue with the site so unless there's some other reason I mean I, I mean like it seems that if we're approving a similar list for recent projects um, we should we, it, it would seem equitable to allow the same uses here but I mean, I'm open to what if, uh, people have other opinions on that, but Mr. Painter, is that a key objective of, <laughs> of the applicant? No, it's not a key objective, but it does allow, as Mr. Krasner says, allows us to be treated on a fair and equitable, uh, you know, platform with all other mixed-use special exceptions. As, as Mr. Krasner pointed out, they are regulated by the Commonwealth of Virginia, so it's not like it's a private liquor store or licenses or anything like that. Um, and as one who uh, wrote a book about the history of Virginia wine, I actually enjoy. <laughs> <laughs> going into the liquor stores and there is only one uh, it is over by the Aldi off of Hillwood Avenue uh, remaining in the city um, thank you we have we have one up by the school too I mean I mean right it's accessible Although, it right. is literally just outside and all the, the for that and I don't know how the Commonwealth you know decides whether or not to open stores but I mean I don't know if they would if that would be would they really open a third in between those two I, I don't know um, and, and, and if I may as well, I mean, you know, at the time that the original Byron Mixed Use Special Exception was approved, and Mr. Stoddard and Mr. Trainer can, can, can correct me, but it was at a time when, you know, we were purely able to do retail sales and restaurant uses. Uh, and it might have also been a time as well when, um, you know, Virginia's uh, liquor um, stores were, were seen as, as purely lower brow, lower shelf things. We now have an entire industry in the Commonwealth based around wine, based around farm distilleries and farm breweries and farm cideries. Uh, this is a, 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 generally speaking, a fairly positive, well-received uh, use and uh, fits in well. Um, so again, the, the ownership is not looking to attract a liquor store, but also doesn't want to be precluded from attracting a liquor store any more than any other mixed use special exception project in the city would be. Well, I think I'm persuaded by the argument that what we're doing it uh, is trying to make the allowed uses for this project to match what the city has recently approved in other mixed use projects. So I, I tend to be persuaded uh, by that argument. Uh, it, um, I, I think we're no. He's the applicant. <laughs> so no. He, At this point, the public uh, comments are are uh, are done. Um, so it's, it's 
it's up for us to, to go ahead and take the next step. Um, You're, you're out of you're out of order. We had the public hearing was closed, right? You're telling me that in my community, I have to accept the establishment of a liquor store because you think it should be standardized with other mixed use communities. That's not a meaningful goal. Standardization is an abstract, conceptual thing that has nothing to do with actually. Right, the public hearing portion has been closed, unless the chairman's going to reopen the public hearing portion and allow speakers to speak twice. I think, I, I think if you'll allow us to go ahead and, and complete our action, I'd appreciate it. Um, so at this point, I guess we're, uh, I believe we're in a position to go ahead and make a motion if somebody would like to do that. And I have a friendly amendment uh, that I'd like to add to it when that's, when that's done. I'll, I'll make the motion. I mean, I, I, when I viewed this again, I, I don't want to make a, a mountain out of a molehill. I mean, I viewed this as a relatively straightforward request um, for, a, you know, a longstanding building in the city that, again, has had Again, demonstrated difficulty in fully leasing out the commercial space. I mean, I think it's always been the goal of the city to have tenants and not have vacant storefronts. And I think the long vacancy and struggle. And I think there's different opinions of you know I'm not a retail expert in, as far as why some of the spaces you know have struggled. You know whether it has to do with you know its visibility, its access to parking. But but clearly the market has has struggled to produce viable tenants there. And I, I'm sure it's in the interest of the owner to, to have those leased. So, I mean, again, I view the request as, as, as equitable and fair um, to, to not single out this building because it happened to be originally approved at an earlier time to a different set of rules that we're not holding other similar buildings to. Um, I don't see any difference fundamentally as far as what we would allow with the Byron versus what we would allow with the Broadway or what we would allow with Founders Row 1 or 2 or Birch and Broad or or any of any of the other sites. So, um, so for that reason, like I said, I'm, I'm going to. Um, I think it's a, it's it's a straightforward request, and I'm I'm in favor of it. Um, so again, in item, this is TR 2234, uh, resolution amending the special exceptions SE 03-0136 and SE 03-0137 for 513 West Broad Street, also known as the Byron, and as amended through resolution 2011-25 to allow for additional permitted service and office uses for the first floor commercial spaces currently restricted under the voluntary concessions, community benefits, terms and conditions. Uh, the, okay, here we go. Whereas uh, an application to amend the previously approved special exception for the Byron building at 513 Broad Street to expand allowable commercial uses on the bottom floor has been filed by, by the applicant, by the owner of the commercial units uh, pursuant to section 48-488 Two in conformance with the procedure set forth in section 48-90 of the city code and whereas at its regular meeting on November 14th 2022 the city council formally referred the special exception amendment to the planning commission for its review and recommendation and whereas the planning commission finds that the proposed amendments generally satisfy the primary and secondary criteria in the zoning code for consideration of special exception applications including conformance with the comprehensive plan and the applicable small area plan. Now, therefore, I move that the Planning Commission recommend to the Council approval of TR 22-34. I'll second. Okay, and I'd like to make a friendly amendment. I'd like to uh, propose adding uh, one additional uh, whereas. It, it would read as follows. Whereas the Planning Commission finds it is appropriate for allowed uses to match what the city has approved in recent mixed-use projects. The, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll accept that amendment. Okay. And is that acceptable? Yes. Okay. Mr. Trainer, would you like to call the vote? Yes. Ms. Weiss? Yes. Mr. Krasner? Yes. Ms. Comont? Yes. Mr. Hira? Yes. Mr. Stevens? Yes. Motion passes. Thank you. I would just add that this is a recommendation to City Council, so anybody wanting to, to make further comments on this does have the opportunity to do that with City Council when they take this issue up. And I believe that's uh, all we have there. So anything else, Mr. Stoddard, before we move into you have one additional minutes. action item on your agenda. Uh, uh, should be a procedural one. Uh, 6B approval of the uh, the Planning Commission minutes from January 4th. Any comments on the, the minutes? 
I wasn't able to find the recording, so I couldn't go back and confirm if the liaisons that we uh, indicated there are correct. I had, yeah, in uh, line 38, that my name is misspelled. And then I think that um, Mr. Stevens is serving on the EDC with. I thought there might have been a, a few little changes there. Like I say, I yeah. couldn't. Uh, Mr. Stevens is, um, and I don't know if that was the EDC or the EDA, but. Might be both. <laughs> yeah, I think it is both. Sorry about that. What, what line? If we was want to. Line 38, uh, my name is misspelled. My last name is misspelled. And then at line 40, uh, Mr. Stevens will serve on the Economic Development Council, which is not a change. I think you could just strike that line. I think the only change we made was um, formally moving me to CACT in Melissa's place. Got it. That and we'll change. have further opportunity to fine tune the, the liaison. So. I think that's probably okay. But I move, uh, we approve the minutes from Wednesday, January 4th with that change. A second. Um, all in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Abstain? The ayes have it. Minutes are formal. Okay, so now we are into our work session on the East Area, uh, East End Small Area Plan. Um, I think we received some excellent input tonight. I like to think that we saw democracy in action. People come out and speak up uh, very much in favor of something that's important to them. So I think that's what we were looking for. Probably didn't get nearly enough uh, comments of, of that nature early on in the process, but. This particular area has uh, a, a lot of challenges that uh, we were advised about uh, very carefully tonight. So um, I think there's, there's a lot for me, at least personally, to chew on. And so my inclination is to agree with Commissioner Weiss that, uh, that this is something that I want to go back. I want to listen to the recordings again and uh, um, you know, kind of chew on this for a bit before um, trying to move this forward into something uh, you know, closer to uh, to a recommendation. We don't have any action on this tonight. Our recommended action, Mr. Sautert, if I if I understand correctly, was in the time frame of early March uh, to make a recommendation to uh, City Council. But uh, we have some time between now and then. And so I'll open it up, Commissioner Weiss. Um, yeah, I, I just want to say sort of I, I, I regret not suggesting that we change the agenda earlier. I hadn't been thinking about the disconnect between the comments and the work session, and I want to apologize to everybody who made time to come here and just thank everybody for being here and for sharing your thoughts, and especially thank all of you who are sticking it out for a late night here. Um, I kind of want to just sort of share, I, I, I agree, I think we need time to reflect on this, but I wanted to share what I heard and my current reflections. Um, I just want to say that I'm really grateful to be on this planning commission and this community and just to share how impactful it was, you know, going through the pandemic and having all these virtual meetings and now this is our second big turnout planning commission meeting and it just means so much to hear from the people who are impacted and to hear from the people in this community. And when I say this community, clearly it's not just our boundaries. I mean, Eden Center is a treasure. It's a regional treasure. It's a national treasure. And, and we heard loud and clear how big the Eden Center community is. It extends far beyond our small little town. Um, so I think, you know, public engagement is challenging and it's been challenging, especially through the pandemic. Um, I think with the best of intentions and limited resources, I think we missed the mark. Um, and, and I, you know, Mr. Hiro did very clearly say at the beginning, we got to go out and outreach directly, you know, to the in the Eden Center community. And we didn't do that. Um, and I think the bottom line of my comments, and I'll have a few more, but I think the bottom line of my comments is that if the businesses in the community and the people of Eden Center don't feel like this small area plan reflects them and their needs, then it's not done and we can't move forward with it. Um, so let me just say what I heard. Um, I heard that, you know, we really need to center the culture, um, the Vietnamese culture specifically. Um, we need to be much more specific about actions to prevent displacement. Um, 
we had people here speaking on behalf of themselves, but and their family members and their friends and their communities. I mean, this is a, a community that we're talking about, and it's a specific community. We heard people talking about um, not going down the path that so many other cities have gone before that leads to gentrification and erasure. Um, you know, we've heard families who had to flee twice, um, you know, flee Vietnam and then were kicked out of Clarendon. And, and we don't want that. And, and I know the people who wrote this plan, you know, the staffers who wrote this plan don't want that either. But, but I, think, um, I think we need to, you know, we need to take, we need to, to, to try again and try differently. Um, I also heard sort of it's the businesses, it's the people, it's the community, it's not the buildings. I'm hearing some disconnect between the business and the community and the building owner and the landowner. Um, hearing a lot of concern about displacement and a, a, a recommendation that was made repeatedly to hire culturally sensitive Vietnamese speakers to do the outreach and to bring this information to the Eden Center community. And I, and I really support that. Um, I, I wanna thank the Viet Place Collective for doing that work. And I'm just guessing that you probably don't wanna be thanked for this, right? Like you, you, you stood up, you did the work, you did the engagement, and thank goodness that happened. Um, but I, I think we need, to, we need to do a better job. And I, and, I, and I think that this plan does need to be, like I, I won't feel comfortable recommending it until we have another public listening session like this where the businesses in the community from the Eden Center come and say, this reflects what I want. This feels like me. This is our community. And, and then I'll know that we've done our work and we've got something that we can recommend. Um, so and I also want to say very specifically, somebody recommended, um, in the vision statement, um, and, and I had been thinking this earlier and then you came and you said it, so thank you, but the vision statement I do think needs to be very specific that um, we're supporting, I can't remember the words, but we, we say it's uh, the vision center is you know, supporting Eden Center, but I think we need to be specific. It's supporting the Vietnamese people, the Vietnamese culture, and um, working against displacement. I think those, those key, those concepts need to be worked into the vision statement. Um, and then I guess my last sort of comment is that we need to take the time, we need to do it right. And, and I wanna just kind of ask staff, what is the consequence of um, taking more time? Like if we don't take action in March, what is the consequence of that? Are there any negative consequences that I'm not thinking about? No. We have all the time in the world, technically. Um, we do have the council work plan that we're working against the timeline there, but if the want of the community, which we've heard today and we've heard before, is more outreach and to get in contact with those business owners, and we, we do need an outreach specialist. Um, it's, a, it's me, myself, and a very small team, and we need help. Um, so that's going to take a lot of extra time and extra work, and we kn we know that. Like we were very aware that the feedback that we have to fold into this plan and the conversations that we have begun, but we need to have more. And we we have a few contacts, and we want more contacts to have these small group discussions. We can expand the plan and we can revise the content. That's what we are gonna to sprint towards next week, but I don't think that it's completely feasible. We have some emails floating out there to, to get these small groups going, um, but traditionally the way we've approached small area planning is someone in the audience said it and it, it's spot on, is that we write this plan and then we take it out to the community. Um, and I think that throughout this process, and it's been great meeting you guys and everyone giving their input, this has been awesome. I think we've learned that maybe this is an opportunity to have the community more involved in the plan that we're writing. Um, we, we didn't do that before. We took our traditional approach of writing and then a engagement period, um, which is noted in the staff report, um, but that's our traditional approach. So to me, as a planner on this project, if we need more time, and we need more time, it's worth it. Um, but again, I am a planner on this project, so I, I do fall under um, timelines of other people as well. But based off of what I've heard, what I know, and what we're working towards in these conversations we've already had, we can 
we can uh, adjust our timeline. So it doesn't have to be March. I, I think that would be worthwhile. Um, were you going to say something, Mr. Sutter? Uh, no, I can't top that. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, just a couple more comments quickly that I, I forgot, and, and then I'll then I'll shut up. Um, I, I know generally small area plans and our comprehensive plan sort of state sort of big picture vision policy plan, um, and then there were there was a request. There were several requests for much more specificity around actions that we can take to prevent displacement, to meet the community's needs, to reflect the community's needs, and so I guess I have a question about. Broader context, I think our small area plans are way too big and unwieldy, and you can there's something in there for everyone. Um, you can find what you want in there, but I think they're, the the community has told us they're not finding what they want. So I wonder, can we just really pare this down and get down to brass tacks and what really matters and focus on the Eden Center and get really specific? Is this an opportunity to bring some of the more specific actions into the small area plan? Or do we need to have like a separate, like, I, I think there's some actions that need to be taken beyond a small area plan is what I'm hearing as well. But anyway, I'll, I'll just stop and turn it over to others. Um, Mr. Krasner, do you want to go ahead? Sure, I'll, I'll go next. I mean, first off, also, I mean, just, I, mean, I generally agree with everything that Ms. Weiss just said, but um, I also, I do want to commend staff. I mean, this is a long effort. And I know that you know we have we're a small city. We're not Fairfax County. We're not Arlington. We have large planning departments. So our staff is made up of a relatively small number of people. And this project started in the midst of the pandemic. And I think that you know any kind of perceived um, slight to the community or, or it was really not intentional for sure. I mean, you know, as was noted, we started talking about this in late 2021. And you know, obviously the the we, the Vietnamese community and the significance of Eden Center was forefront in our mind you know, when people think about the east end which is what we call it because it's the east end of the city of falls church um you know the eden center is the number one landmark there are other sites there but um so from the get-go it certainly was um the primary um sort of site that we were considering and, I, and so any perceived um lack of outreach was it was i mean i know it was not intentional and i know that based on the comments we received tonight, clearly it, it, it didn't hit the mark, but um, it wasn't intentional, and I know not from this commission, and I mean, I think it's safe to speak for staff that they've, they've been trying their best, but they're going to do more now in light of this, because, you know, there isn't a, a deadline that we're, we're, we have to, we're, we're, we're like a train on the tracks, and we have to get to get to the end at, on March 1st. Um, we can take the time to, to do more work and do more outreach um, with the community, but um, I mean, some things I heard that I think struck a chord with me. I mean, I think Ms. Weiss mentioned that. I mean, some of the comments about you know, the, the, the nuance between the buildings and the people, I mean, I, I kind of hear that because we've heard a lot about how the, the buildings themselves, you know, are, are in need of some of some renovation. And you know, we've heard we've heard complaints um, from current tenants about the state of the buildings and the upkeep of the site. And so, you know, part of the issue of the planning process is trying to provide the landowner some incentive to continue to invest in the property, but right, it's a double-edged sword. You don't want to inadvertently then, right, you know, uh, induce a level of redevelopment that displaces the current businesses because we do want to preserve that. Um, and so, but that's kind of what the whole planning process is about. And, and it is important. I mean, it, it's a guide, but as was stated, um, it, it, it does help direct and inform the development community and landowners about what the city wants to see, you know, in these areas. And so, in that sense, it is important that we get it right, um, and it is something that we would expect, you know, future development to, to to follow. So, so it is important. You know, the interesting thing that people mentioned about parking. I mean, obviously, parking. Anyone who follows planning knows that parking is kind of a hot button issue. Some of our neighbors in Fairfax and Arlington are also struggling with the issue of parking. Um, but the point that was made that you know many people who visit the site are driving; they're coming from farther away, um, and and being able to access the access the site. That's that was a, I think a good point to make as far as making sure that you know people who are arriving by car, which is probably the majority of people, um, have ways they can they can conveniently access access that site. Um, but you know, also you know, but bigger picture, you know, beyond Eden Center, I think you know, I think there are a lot of good things in the plan, Ms. Bazemore. So I do want to commend you. You know, there there are several nodes that we're talking about here outside of the Eden Center site, um, and I think that there are a lot of good concepts that are in there. You've been continuing to refine it, and so I, it certainly um, is moving in the right direction on some of those fronts. I think 
The Eden Center site probably is the most difficult to deal with because of the issues we heard tonight, and some of which we were already aware of for sure, um, but it definitely brought it into focus. Um, I'll also just, you know, before I turn it over, I'll just, I'll commend the folks that spoke tonight. I mean, clearly, you know, one thing that was interesting that shows that we have to do more work is, I guess we had someone here who was ready to interpret, but we, we didn't have, you know, the generation of, of, of residents that, that needed an interpreter. So, you know, it's good that the younger generation was here, but obviously, as was said, the older generation of, of Vietnamese folks who um, that site is just as important to, um, they're clearly, you know, we haven't heard from them directly. And I think that's why going out to the site I think that's where you're going to hear from those folks more. You know, they're busy, they're business owners, they don't, they can't always take time to come out to a meeting at night, but if you go to meet them there during the day, um, I have a feeling you'll hear from a lot of folks there, you know, with an interpreter who can, who can um, and I think that'll be really important. So I think, based on what we heard, I think we're, I certainly think we're going to do that. Um, and, and, and if it takes more than one meeting, I think the city would be open to having multiple meetings out there to, to hear, hear from folks. So. Um, I certainly think that's the right way to go. But so that's what I heard, and, and I think it will take us longer, perhaps, than just one more work session in February, and like voting on March 1st. Um, and I think that's okay. I think that's fine because that's what it, what it takes to get it right, and it is important that we get it right. Good. Thank you, uh, Mr. Hyro. Your turn. Oh, I will, but you can hide. Okay. Um, yeah. I mean, I just want to second a lot of what both of my colleagues said. Um, particularly the point about uh, thanking the community for their comments. It was really a lot of very powerful testimony tonight. And it was, uh, I'm sorry that it's so late in the process. I understand all of the concern and trepidation about the plan. I think there's a lot of good reason for that, you know, considering the history of this community. Um, so I feel like, well, now we have everybody involved. So how can we capitalize on that? And that comment, Emily, that you, that you noted, I also wrote it down. Uh, verbatim, and I think he said, you should ask people how they want to be helped, not tell them. And I thought that was really um, very insightful. So I hope we can ask you all how we can help at this point and, you know, work all of your suggestions into the plan. Um, I really appreciated the comments about, you know, Eden Center being, um, you know, it's really a community. It's, it's the people and the businesses, and it's not just the buildings. Um, but I also heard a lot of concern about the buildings themselves and the maintenance. I know there was an article in 2014 about the tenants suing the landlord and the reports of the conditions of the buildings at that time were not good. Rents were reported to be many times that what others were paying. So that is a related, but I feel like a separate issue from this. But I hope that the city can do what it can to help support our business owners at Eden Center. Um, if those issues are ongoing, and I, I just I don't know enough to know whether that's the case. Um, we'd love to hear from you all if it is. Um, I, I think that uh, it's the idea of exploring a cultural overlay district for Eden Center is a really good one, and I'd love to learn more about that, Emily. I'm sure you're going to be looking at it. Um, any sort of real actionable um, policies that we can use with teeth that would help protect because I definitely don't want to end up with DC's Chinatown or Clarendon, which, you know, when I, I lived in Clarendon in the early 2000s, and there were a few, a few remaining Vietnamese business, v, uh, businesses left at the time. But it was, I, I never got to experience it when it was Little Saigon. And I would also recommend that, um, or that oral history, the echoes of um, Little Saigon uh, that the Virginia Tech students did to everyone. It's a really, really uh, powerful uh, piece. Um, so the only other thing I want to say is that I did hear a lot of desire for, you know, improvements in this area. Uh, there's trepidation about it, for sure, any change, but also people want safer, you know, tr options for transportation. They want gathering spaces. Um, so there's a lot that's in the plan that's appealing to the community. So. I think our task is like really figuring out how we can do those things without unintentionally breaking what we already have. Um, I think those are all my comments. But thank you all for coming tonight. Really appreciate it. Uh, well, I'll just add a couple of things. I really um, appreciated all the comments that came from the community, but also I appreciate the way all of you on the commission have taken that in and reflected and thought um, 
about those comments and how we can change uh, and refine uh, our plan so that it is equitable, that it is inclusive growth, um, and that it does not do, I mean, we heard terms like cultural erasure, structural violence. We don't often use those terms when we're thinking about our small area plans, but to people who fear that they're going to be displaced, double displaced, and triple displaced, and it's affected three generations of their families, we have to be more intentional in what we're doing. Um, and I understand, uh, Brent, you said that, you know, it was during the pandemic, we, we didn't do, we maybe didn't do the outreach we should have, um, and it wasn't intentional, but at the same time, I mean, we know there's a history of mistrust, there's a history of gentrification, there's a history of urban renewal projects that just displace people. And so even though, because we know all of that, we should have been more thoughtful from the beginning. Now, hopefully we will be more thoughtful now as we, as we move forward. Um, but to prevent this from being structural violence or cultural erasure, we have to be really intentional with our anti-displacement strategies. And I heard many folks say and give us really good recommendations on doing that. And what that means is we have to put resources towards that. Um, I think we need to signal to the development community, you can't just come in here and do your typical development. You've got to come here and do inclusive development. And we, as a priority, don't put profits over people. We're actually putting people and culture over profits. So to do that, we've got to be really intentional. Um, I heard someone say, take the tax base that's coming from the Eden Center and reinvest it to protect the small businesses. We should do that. That should be part of our language with this small area plan. And I know we often talk about how oh, our job is just zoning and it's just big visioning, but financing relates to executing on that vision. So we for sure in this plan should have finance recommendations for the city council on how to do inclusive growth and how to do anti-displacement. Um, I'm really glad that planning staff reached out to the SBAN, um, University of Maryland, anti-small business displacement. They are the best. They have some great recommendations. But they're just recommendations. It's going to take the city council to implement and execute and change our operating budget or our capital budget so that small businesses don't get displaced. And it's also going to take all of you who are still here, but all the people that were here and all the people who weren't here to keep coming to these meetings to advocate to move the city council. Because, you know, it is a zero sum game. There isn't that much money. People want to have, they want to do stuff for parks. They want to do stuff to stimulate economic development. They want a movie theater. They want money to go to the school system. And in order to get money for anti-displacement, you've got to take some of that money. And the only way you can take some of that money is with political mobilization, like you did tonight. But that has to continue. Because um, we can all say we'd love to see a plan that doesn't displace anybody. But then we're going to say, oh, but it's out of our control. I mean, developers are the ones that do everything. We just have a plan, and we can't control what development they do. Um, but we can put barriers, and we can send signals. We have not sent a signal to the folks at the Eden Center or to the development community that we want development in this part of the town that does not displace any of the small businesses. We have to do that. We say we have the time to do that, so let's do it. But let's not also like go to the experts who are academics. Let's just go to the people who are at the Eden Center and ask them what do they think is the best strategy to make sure they stay in place, to make sure that the buildings get upgraded and the rents don't escalate beyond what they can pay, to make sure that there's development but sufficient parking, and they know how much parking is needed. Let's ask them, because I know a lot of you on the Planning Commission, and I know a lot of residents of the city want less parking, less parking, because it's more environmentally friendly, but that reducing the carbon footprint can also displace the small businesses. We've got to balance our ideas of sustainability on the environment and social sustainability and equity for the very vulnerable businesses that are there. 
Um, so again, I, I want to thank everybody who came out. Um, I want to thank the staff. I want to thank all the planning commissioners. But it is time to roll up our sleeves and get to work. Because this plan, as, as it is right now, has fallen short. Um, and there's a lot of mistrust. And it's not even about developing the right plan and having the right recommendations. It's really about us as a city having trusting relationships. And to build trust takes time. So we've got, we haven't built the trust at the Eden Center. That is very clear to me. So let's just go there and build trust and ask people what they want to see and then revise this plan. So thank you. If I could just respond. Thank to you. I don't know, I hate to go twice, but just if I could respond to Mr. Hira. Then I, I go. And I, I don't disagree with anything he's, he said. I also think, you know, we also have to be cognizant of the, you know, maybe it's, I don't know if it's the elephant in the room, but the Eden Center is owned by one, you know, it's one, there's one owner of that property. One work, one entity owns that. And so outreach, you know, and I know the city has, have, does have a relationship with, with that owner, but, um, you know, I think that obviously becomes very important in any discussion about this. Um, that person certainly is a stakeholder. That entity is certainly a stakeholder, too. Um, and in order for anything to go forward and, and be feasible, you know, it needs to, you know, we can't ignore that. I mean, we, we, we have to be cognizant of, of, of both sides of the equation. So just to, you know, put that out there that, you know, the, the reality of the, you know, the, the situation. That's it. Okay. Well, I have just a few comments to make, uh, mainly because of what I said earlier, that I, I prefer to kind of chew on this for a bit and go back and listen to the comments uh, more carefully. <clears throat> to, to make sure that I've uh, absorbed everything. Um, but I, I kind of heard risks uh, in one direction tonight, which is the risks of development. If we do it wrong, uh, the risk is displacement, gentrification. Uh, incidentally, that's, that's a risk in the rest of the city and the rest of the country right now, where we're facing a lot of gentrification uh, uh, as housing prices uh, escalate uh, throughout the country. And it has uh, consequences that are uh, very undesirable. So it's, it's a valid issue and uh, one that certainly needs to, to be looked at uh, very carefully. Uh, at the same time, I would argue that there are risks if you don't have plans on how to develop, if you just kind of freeze things in place, uh, the risk is that you will go into decline. Um, so trying to find the right balance, I think, is, is, the, is the challenge uh, and the goal for planning. And, and I think in this case, taking some additional time, and I think that seems to be the consensus where we're, we're headed uh, on the comments here tonight, uh, is well worth uh, trying to get that balance uh, right. So, uh, so that's kind of how I see it. Uh, just one other thought, and that <laughs> for those of us, yeah, we're, we're volunteers as uh, planning commissioners. I think we proved once again tonight it's it's not for the compliments, <laughs> but uh, but it's for the ability to uh, to to do what we did tonight to hear thoughtful comments from the community in hopes that we can get the process of planning right. So, so that's all I have. Did, Commissioner Weiss? Yeah, I just have one, one more comment. And because the, 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 the second piece of what I said was a bit inarticulate, but Mr. Hyra sort of helped me crystallize it as I was thinking about it. And, and that's sort of, you know, we, we heard a lot about, uh, you know, the Eden Center Vietnamese community's sort of needs. Um, and I'm sort of thinking about the tools we have available. The, the small area plan is a tool that the city has at its disposal. It's not the only tool. And so, um, you know, I was looking through the, you know, there are d different chapters of the small area plan have strategies. Um, but the strategies tend to be one-liners, right? And then there's a lot more meat that might be built out somewhere else. I think it might be helpful um, in the course of engagement to, to sort of start to bucket out or to communicate. I I'm also just thinking about like, I, you know, historically marginalized communities, not part of the political process for language barriers, time barriers, whatever. This is a very white, you know, there's no Vietnamese speakers on this. It, well, to my knowledge, I don't speak Vietnamese <laughs> on, on this on this panel. You know, like representation is an issue. Um, and so as we begin to engage and we ask people how we can help them, I think we can also maybe demystify some of the tools available at our disposal. Here's what we can do in a small area plan. I'm hearing other needs here. Here are some other legislative tools that we have available to us. And I think if we build sort of a, a package 
of other potential recommendations that accompany a small area plan. Um, you know, because I was hearing, you know, asks for better security, you know, parking safety, um, much more specific um, support for the business owners there. I, I suspect, I'm not an expert on this, but some of the displacement actions wouldn't necessarily sit in a small area plan. They would be in other parts of the city's arsenal of action. So I think it might be helpful for planning staff to start to put together that menu of tools. Like as we hear needs from the community, here's what would go in a small area plan because of the role that it plays and here's some other places. Because I think we'll probably need some sort of comprehensive set of recommendations when this comes back to us beyond a small area plan, if that makes sense. Okay, does anyone have any final comments they want to make on this issue? Just one other thing, it's not related to this plan. It's to put this plan in context of all the other planning that's happening around this plot. Um, so that I just fear that we're, we're now going to really think about how can we do equitable development within the scope of this plan. But there are other plans adjacent to this plan that are going to go forward that are going to lead to escalating property values and escalating rents. I know we can't control that, but it contextualizes the fear of displacement that may be there that we say, oh, well, we, we're not, we don't have anything to do with that. But like, that's important for us to understand. So one of the things that maybe we could have is get some of Fairfax's plans that abut this site so that we have a better overview and also the tenants have a better understanding of what's Fairfax doing, what's Falls Church doing, how do the combination of do these two things potentially affect us. And when we think about anti-displacement strategies, we may have to start partnering with Fairfax on it because what Fairfax is going to do is also going to escalate the property values and the rents at the Eden Center. I didn't hear anything about what was going around this site, and we all know that development near the site will affect the site that we're planning for. And I think that would help educate the residents who live over there, the business owners, and also us in terms of making a very thoughtful decision about how we move forward based on the overall context for that site. Okay, going once, twice, final comments? All right, well, the purpose of our work session was to provide feedback to, to staff, so I think we've accomplished that for tonight. We have some additional items on the agenda to see if we can get through in a half an hour or so or less. Um, yes. I, I think it's just worth noting, um, I think I saw maybe some people recording things, but this, this entire session is recorded, so for anybody who couldn't be here, you can find the conversation online, you can share that with your community. Okay, very good. All right, okay, so I think we're moving one, on. Oh, just one quick comment for everybody. I don't want to see myself on TikTok. I saw there was some TikTok things going on, and, uh, <laughs> but I'm fine with Twitter as of right now. Noted. Uh, okay, I think we are into information items. Do any of the planning commissioners have reports that they'd like to make? <laughs> Seeing none, I think uh, Mr. Stoddard, uh, it's uh, your turn to provide the planning director's report. Sure. Thank you, Chair. Uh, let me just walk through a couple items that are in the director's report here, and then as usual, I'll also do a, uh, a look ahead on your, your agenda. Uh, so just walking through the director's, oh great, we've got it up on the screen. So, uh, so first up, this is, um, first item here is related to outdoor dining and parking minimums. Uh, there was um, uh, some, uh, some draft concepts that uh, planning staff brought to city council at a recent work session. Uh, and this is something that'll probably be coming your way soon in the form of a zoning text amendment. And so obviously wanted to give you a heads up early uh, and also get any direction that you all might, might want to provide as we're building the draft. Um, 
So just walking through some of the materials in the report here. So obviously the community has, has received outdoor dining well. Uh, uh, the, the restaurant patrons are enjoying it. The restaurant businesses, uh, the restaurant owners are obviously relying on it uh, in part to get them through the pandemic. But now it's just become a regular part of business. Uh, outdoor dining is operating under temporary measures that went in place at the start of the pandemic. Uh, those are set to expire uh, at the end of March of this calendar year, so in, in just over two months' time. Uh, and so Council positively did direct staff to, to go ahead and, and bring forward provisions that would make outdoor dining permanent. Uh, in our early work session with Council, uh, staff suggested uh, we did uh, bring a, a, a sort of a pitch to Council previously uh, to use a special use permit process so that specific conditions uh, related to specific properties could be considered. And staff said, no, we want to be uh, much more business friendly than that. We want these turnarounds to be quicker. Uh, outdoor dining is something people like. It should be easier to make it happen. Uh, so in response to that direction from Council, this time we brought forward a package with two suggested changes, and they're there in the bullet points. Uh, first uh, is uh, making clear in the zoning ordinance uh, that outdoor dining is a uh, by right accessory use uh, to any restaurant that's already operating in the city. Uh, and then the second, and, and this is really related to what made outdoor dining work uh, in the first place during the pandemic. So when the temporary provisions went in, uh, uh, what council really said was uh, by, by the, the temporary adjustments in the zoning ordinance, what they said is we're going to relax the parking uh, so that you can put outdoor dining in your parking spaces. And so at the heart of it, what made outdoor dining work was the regulatory flexibility to reuse the, those surface parking spaces. Um, so that's what motivated staff's rec second recommendation. Uh, and that is to go ahead and uh, um, eliminate uh, parking requirements uh, for commercial buildings with less than 20,000 square feet of interior space. Um, certainly this would provide a pathway for those older buildings in the city uh, uh, to be able to tenant themselves as restaurants and run outdoor dining, uh, but it would have other benefits as well uh, at the staff level. Uh, we certainly hear from folks that want to set up businesses and they can't meet the parking requirements, so they can't get a certificate of occupancy to occupy a space. And so this is a way to remove that barrier so that people can set up shop and run it in any building they want in the city. Um, and uh, obviously this has the related benefit of holding on to some of these structures, uh, that when landlords get stuck and they can't find a future uh, sort of economic use for their building, they start looking at redevelopment options. So a lot of the buildings that would be preserved or potentially preserved by this uh, are some of those older buildings think about the 100 block of Broad Street uh, or maybe some of those smaller buildings that you see along Hillwood Avenue, uh, those buildings that have been up for a long time and people have gotten used to them and enjoy them, um, but they can struggle to retenant. Um, you uh, presented this or you and your staff presented this item to City Council. I think it was at the last meeting and that's good, good to go back and take a look at that. I think it's background for us for that item. I was just wondering, are there any changes that you anticipate making to the proposal as you made it then when it comes to us? Uh, so, uh, right, on timing, so it went to council as a work session item, and I think you're right on that timing that it was last week. The, uh, we're scheduled to go to council works, uh, second council work session uh, with draft zoning code at their February 6th work session. Uh, and then depending on that work session, it would be scheduled for first reading the following week, February 13th. Uh, I think what we're gonna do is, um, uh, we'll go back and watch the tapes on what the various council members were uh, suggesting and, and uh, wanted to see as it came back to them in draft ordinances. Um, so we'll look at that. It, it, you know, there may be some, uh, we may explore a couple options. Is 20,000 square feet the right number? Should it be tied to a specific use? Should it be tied to a specific square footage? Um, it seems like that's where maybe the conversation is, is, is going to go. Oh, okay. Uh, so it's got some more work to go through before it comes to us. Right, and I think the and I think one thing just to keep in mind is um, right. It, it, um Assuming it proceeds to first reading, uh, of course, out of first reading, council can approve anything between sort of uh, what's on the books today and what they propose at second reading. So it might be worth suggesting something that's maybe a little more ambitious because um, you can always pare it back during that, that uh, sort of community outreach. Were there any comments from the commissioners on this, uh, preliminary comments? I just want to heartily endorse the idea of eliminating minimum parking requirements for these smaller commercial buildings. I'd love to see more adaptive reuse and um, preservation of these smaller buildings. So, and I, you know, I think that um, bringing vibrant 
uses to the city in the form of um, you know, commercial retail and restaurants and outdoor dining is all a good thing for the city, certainly much better than parking. And I, I'm obviously not a big fan of parking. We do need it. And, but the one place that I would definitely support it is at Eden Center, because I think that that comment that the person made about that is a destination that people drive to is absolutely spot on. So sorry, a little bit of a diversion there. So don't like parking generally. <laughs> but in that place, yes. But in, in here, I think it just makes, I think it makes a lot of sense. Um, curious about how you're thinking about that cutoff point, the 20,000 square feet, or if you thought about it as, you know, like businesses with certain kinds of uses or, I, you know, I mean, I don't know. Have you, what, what kinds of um, signals are you incorporating in that decision? So there are, um, and one, it's good to hear the, the early feedback on, on sort of the proposal. So the, the reason for the 20,000 square foot number there, uh, so there are already provisions on the book for some of the larger shopping centers and the larger redevelopments to get reduced parking requirements. So obviously the redevelopment projects, you all see them a lot. It's the TDM plans and they can knock down their parking numbers there. Uh, the larger shopping centers already have an allowance. Uh, there's a uh, shopping center reduction percentage that you can use um, by right. Um, so the larger buildings already have um, those allowances, it's the smaller buildings that don't have it. Uh, and so that 20,000 number uh, was really sort of like a, like a feet on the street sort of survey, just sort of walking around the city and then going back and looking up, well, how many square feet are actually in this building? Um, and, and is this the kind of building um, not, you know, my deciding is it the kind of building that should be preserved, but is it sort of the kind of building that, that maybe needs a sort of a second economic future uh, it, besides tearing down? Great. Yeah, thank you. I'm, I'm definitely in support of this idea. Mm -hmm. Good. Okay. Any other comments? All right. And I think we can move on. I don't know if you have anything uh, regarding the um, transportation study. Sure. Uh, and uh, so this is the West Falls Church Active Transportation Study, just reporting out on this one. This was recently completed uh, by the Fairfax County Planning Team, uh, and this was a plan to better connect uh, and active transportation is a, a shop talk term. It's uh, walking, biking, um, scooters, e-bikes. Uh, it's they've got a sort of a very long definition, but it's it's sort of generally anything mostly human propelled. Uh, but uh, there's probably some electronics in some of those systems as well. Uh, but they looked at how to get people uh, sort of in and around uh, the West Falls Church Metro Station uh, a little bit easier. They had various stakeholder groups, community meetings. Uh, they broke the area up into various quadrants and thought about specific ideas for different areas. And then they had a couple different recommended lists. So there was a, a stakeholder recommended list, a survey recommended list. So it was uh, really quite a lot of thought went into it. So this list is very much pared down. But I thought uh, these were ideas that were um, sort of most related to uh, the city's efforts uh, to improve walking and biking uh, in and around the west end of the city. Uh, and I'll just call them out here. Um, uh, making the, the, the Route 7, Shreve Road, Haycock Road intersection easier to cross. Uh, I don't think that should be a surprise to anyone that that's a need. Uh, getting a better pathway um, uh, to connect the WNOD to the development in the West End, that's number two. Uh, number three, uh, improving the pathway along Leesburg Pike from Idlewood Road to, to Falls Church Drive. So that's the, the stretch of Leesburg Pike that's going under uh, the Interstate 66 overpass uh, and finding a way to get a ped bike connection from the Pimmett Hills neighborhood, the Idlewood neighborhood, to um, uh, the West Falls metro area. And then number four, um, this was encouraging to see. Uh, it's something we had explored early um, with the West End development, but but um, uh, it didn't get into the plans at the time. But but uh, now uh, Fairfax County staff is at least sort of looking at this as a possibility for portions of Haycock, the idea of a road diet, uh, actually taking away some of those auto lanes and using them for other purposes. Uh, if, if you look at the, there are certainly times of day when there are crushes in terms of, um, you know, the number of folks that want to drive up and down that street. Uh, but if you look at the overall sort of average daily traffic, uh, it is within the round, uh, sort of the realm that, that uh, sort of VDOT and FHWA consider uh, sort of eligible to, to at least review a road diet. Yeah, hopefully we keep in mind too as we think about that. And I think that sounds like a great idea to me um, that we'd like to get some type of bike capability from the WNOD to the to the school campus as well. And so where that crosses on Haycock, I think 
We'll yeah, it's already in the CIP. The I don't have an update. Well, it's actually in the quarterly work plan update, I think. But um, Northern Virginia Transportation Authority previously funded a uh, sort of a spur trail or a connector trail uh, to link the WNOD to the West End development. Uh, and the vision for that is to uh, work along the was at the east side of the road uh, along the buyer property. Uh, and so that would provide a proper 10 foot use, uh, 10 foot trail with lighting, um, proper storm drainage control so it doesn't wash out to gravel. Uh, and uh, the city's partnering with Fairfax County to deliver that. Good, okay. Anything else on that uh, Just the two other items, uh, the council work plan, a uh, quarterly update so everyone's aware, the uh, council does have a two year work plan. Um, uh, and the city manager is reporting quarterly on, on progress against that plan, and uh, he most recently uh, provided that update in January of this year, uh, and so I've included that in your packet for your information. Uh, and then the second is our planning and zoning quarterly report. Uh, I, I acknowledge we missed the last one, uh, so I'm, I'm glad we got it out this time. Uh, but this is a quarterly report documenting uh, personnel highlights, where we are on our budgets and our expenditures, uh, and then the major initiatives that are underway in terms of what we got done in the last quarter uh, and what we're looking forward to in the, in the upcoming months. See, there was considerable underspending on the budget. I presume that's because of not having staff in place. Yeah, we're, uh, we were authorized with the most recent budget to, to hire additional positions, and obviously we're moving forward with those, those hirings full steam. Uh, it does take a couple months to, to, to go through the recruitment process, and so what shows up in those salary numbers is the uh, sort of the underspending um, uh, that comes with sort of that recruitment process. I, I think we have been using uh, some of those dollars uh, productively. Uh, as was mentioned, a lot of the translation services we're using tonight, as well as for the rest of the East End Small Area Plan, we're paying for that from uh, um, money we didn't spend on, on salaries. Is the big planning commission salary in that, reflected in that? <laughs> that is a line item in our, if in so, our budget. so, can we advocate for a you know, cost of living increase for a COLA? <laughs> we can bring that up. Can I'm I making ask, my budget pitch uh, next month. Speaking of staff changes, our zoning administrator, John Boyle, has retired, right? Yes. As of the end of December. And is it, did, is it uh, Akita Rousey? Akita yeah, Rousey. Akita Rousey is. is she is, officially uh, the zoning administrator? She is. Yeah. yeah. And is she right. sort of acting or if she is for, she is, will be the zoning administrator going forward? Okay. She is great. the zoning administrator. Oh, right. Akita is terrific. So yeah. Call her with all our zoning complaints. <laughs> we even have a, an assistant now, right? Uh, yeah. I was wondering about that. Is it? One yeah, so this was very exciting. We, uh, 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 you know, uh, credit to uh, sort of the finance office and the HR office for working with us on this. We actually hired Akita's replacement, uh, sort of a head of Akita, uh, sort of assuming the new position. So when Akita stepped into that job, she was stepping in with the staffing she expected to have. We didn't immediately leave her with a, with a gap. We didn't make her do two jobs on day one. <laughs> but there is not additional resources for the zoning administrator the, there are there so are. Uh, okay. we uh, so a couple so it's shifts. not a backfill for her pre planning position it's a it's a new position or uh, uh, yes to both so okay. uh, the zoning office previously was uh, John Boyle was um, a full-time position on zoning as the zoning administrator and then uh, he had the benefit of half of Akita's time the got other it. half was okay. in planning so she still got that she's got all of her time now and she's got half of Laura's time uh, she's uh, in Young, um, uh, who used to work uh, on the permit counter, uh, has earned a certification in property maintenance, uh, in part motivated by uh, ongoing issues at the fields. Uh, and so she's now working uh, as a property maintenance official for the city, uh, reporting to the zoning official. Uh, within the budget, we've also got approval, and we've, we've got a higher starting, I think, in a couple months uh, uh, to work as a, a, a zoning planner, uh, also under uh, Akita's direction. And so the zoning office is going to go from one and a half people to two and a half people. Great. Great. Okay. Um, I believe we have the opportunity to meet next Wednesday again, right? <laughs> On, uh, roll up our sleeves and uh, uh, Rest up. handle uh, T-zones. <laughs> and then, because that's going to be... Our, do our push-ups and... Uh, Another DZ. Is, is there going to be public comment at that? No. No, that's I didn't the, think so, right? The whole point of it was it's going to be like a hands-on work session for us. It's, it's really for us to... Uh, the table here. We actually, I think the plan is to meet in the um, Dogwood Room. Yeah, you'll be in an alternate location. Uh, the session will be, uh, so uh, just a clarification on, on a comment earlier. So the, your annual meeting, your annual advance was not recorded. 
um, that was to uh, uh, give a better sense of sort of comfort of sort of who's in the room and who's hearing the conversation so that we, we made sure everyone had was, was up to speed on the conversation as it was happening. Um, uh, I think that was a, a one-time thing for the annual advance. Obviously, the expectation is you all will, will sort of record your meetings going forward um, uh, as you're sort of hearing regular business. Um, but I do think uh, leaving the advance sort of untelevised is there's there's obviously still opportunity for public engagement. Everyone can come into the meeting. It's public. Um, I think just having it uh, sort of reserved to the folks that are in this resume, room is helpful. Uh, so this is what's up on the screen is the, the look ahead on your the back of your agenda. The January 25th meeting next Wednesday it is a special work session. Um, and I, I, you know, my recommendation is, is that you all have already had the benefit of a lot of public comment on T-Zones. And so I think the time on the 25th should really be reserved for you all to work out what you want your recommendations to council back, um, back to council to be. Um, uh, certainly in past work sessions, staff has heard questions about, you know, are we being clear about what's the intent, what's the public purpose behind these T-zones and these T-zone changes? Uh, what are the specific elements that need to go into site design? How do we want to make sure that this is inclusionary growth and it include, includes the right level of affordability in these projects going forward? Um, so staff will all will um, sort of set the table with some ideas on how to achieve those things, but obviously the time on the 25th is, is for you all to make it your recommendation. Uh, we do have, just staying with T-Zones, if I could stay on that thread, on February 9th, uh, we're working with the League of Women Voters to host a public town hall. Uh, so my hope is that uh, coming out of that January 25th work session, uh, obviously you all aren't voting on the 25th, but, uh, but obviously to have a fairly solidified recommendation, um, staff can present that to the League of Women Voters and, and obviously community participants uh, on that town hall on the 9th, uh, and that will set you all up for your public hearing uh, on the same item February 15th. And that would be making your recommendation back to council. Uh, Can I ask if we're still going to have the East End Small Area Plan work session on February 15th? I think we're going to look at that schedule in light of the comments okay. tonight, direction from the commission, and I think what we'll probably think about is um, uh, obviously there's there's no intent to rush the plan, and I think we want to think again about uh, is there a better way we can engage with the community um, uh, before we say, okay, here's the next draft, because um, I think we want to make sure we're hearing from the community and that, and that their voices are the ones in the draft, not ours. That sounds good. I think that's the right thing to do. I think it's also helpful to us because those three items, CIP, uh, T-Zones, and East End would be a lot a for lot. one night. Yeah. 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 Yep. Agreed. Not any parking out there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The uh, the other item, uh, I think other things you've already heard. Uh, so obviously East End schedule is moving, and then CIP work session. So you, um, it, you did have the introductory work session uh, with Deputy Manager um, Cindy Mester, uh, and she'll be coming back uh, to the commission with a with a proposed CIP uh, for your work session on February fifteenth, uh, and then it's a short turnaround. Uh, to get to your all's recommend public hearing and recommendation, uh, your following meeting on March 1st. Okay, barring any final comments, I think uh, we are completed for this evening and uh, look forward to seeing you all in a week. We are adjourned. All right. Good job, Sharon.